resurgence of cases and undetected transmission among younger and healthier population suggests that COVID-19 outbreak will likely continue for the foreseeable future until a safe and effective vaccine becomes widely available. Sustaining national growth through ingenuity and innovation in the new normal. From the new normal to a new future. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. Debates on how best to promote sustainable and inclusive development are incomplete without a full consideration of issues of science, technology, and innovation. Access to new and appropriate technologies promote steady improvements in living conditions, which can be life-saving for the most vulnerable populations and drive productivity gains, which ensure rising income. There are two essential science technology and innovation issues that need to be tackled simultaneously in the post-2015 development agenda. Firstly, innovation-driven growth is no longer the prerogative of high-income countries alone. Some developing countries have achieved significant economic growth through the creation and deployment of science, technology, and innovative capacities. But this has not been the case for all countries in developed in particularly the lower developing countries. Secondly, science, technology, and innovation policy has often been pursued independently of the broader development agenda. It is important that science, technology, and innovation be integrated into public policy goals, giving particular focus to the nexus between science, technology, and innovation, then culture, education, and development between the nations. In addressing these issues, science, technology, and innovation will need to be made more participatory and inclusive so that there's public engagement in the scientific endeavors from the full spectrum of social actors, including women. The least developed kind of efforts to build this science, technological, and innovative capacities. Joining us today as our panelists chairing the plenary session, we have Professor Kamvir Arya, Department of Computer Science, ABV, Indian Institute of Information Technology and Management, Gwalia, India. And also joining us as our elite panelists, we have Professor Mutkumar Sivakumar, School of Civil Mining and Environmental Engineering, Faculty of Engineering and in Information Sciences, University of Wollongong, Australia. Then Professor Sivil Kumar Vadu, Department of Electrical, Electronic and Telecommunication Engineering, General Sir John Kutalawa Defense University. And also Professor Ashok Pereira from Department of Civil Engineering, University of Moratua. Professor Duwan Gopura from Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Moratua. Ladies and gentlemen, we warmly welcome you to the 14th episode of the International Research Conference of General Sir John Kutalavala Defence University, Sri Lanka. Dr. Kanvir Arya achieved the Master of Engineering degree in Electrical Engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, India, and earned his PhD degree in Computer Science and Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, IIT, Kanpur, India. Presently, he's working as a professor at ABV, Indian Institute of Information Technology and Management, Gwalia, India. He also served Motila Nehru National Institute of Technology, Allahabad, MGP Rohikan University, Bali, and worked as Dean of Postgraduate Studies and Research at AKTU University, Lucknow. He was summer visiting faculty at San Diego State University, San Diego, California, USA in 2013. He has more than 28 years of experience to teach the undergraduate and postgraduate classes. He has guided 11 PhD and 86 MTech dissertations and presently guiding three PhD and four MTech students. He was also a part of Indo-UK Cybersecurity Summit, 
organized in March 2013 jointly by Research Council UK and DST India. Dr. Arya has co-authored a book titled Security in Mobile Ad Hoc Networks and edited two books, namely Emerging Wireless Communication and Biometric Computing, published by Springer and Taylor Francis. He has successfully completed a couple of funded projects on image analysis. Dr. Arya has chaired the technical sessions in international and national conferences in India and abroad and delivered many invited keynotes in India. USA, Singapore, South Korea, Mexico, Sri Lanka, Thailand, and also in Malta. Dr. Arya is on the editorial board of many international journals. He has also edited the proceedings of the 9th IEEE International Conference on Industrial and Information Systems, held on 15 and 17 December 2014 at Gwalior, India, and currently is the member of Organizing Committee and Program Committee for various national and international conferences and workshops. He is also a senior member of IEEE, a fellow of IETE, Fellow Institute, Institution of Engineers India, a member of ASEAN and a lifetime member of ISTE. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Kamrit Arya, the chairperson of the engineering plenary session of the 14th International Research Conference of General Sir John Kutalawa Defense University, Sri Lanka. Over to you, sir. Very good afternoon, uh, all there. Dignities present here, uh, particularly the uh, Professor M. Siva Kumar, Professor S. Kumar Avadu, Professor Asok Pareda, and Professor R. Bakura, uh, who are the uh, keynote speakers of this plenary session. So I welcome you all, sir, uh, to this plenary session of this International Research Conference of uh, uh, this uh, uh, defense university. Uh, I, in the beginning, I just request uh, all the speakers, please just uh, uh, to take care of the time because the time allotted is half an hour. And, uh, and uh, another thing is that we will take all the questions after all the four talks are completed. So in between, we will not take the questions. So I will just request the audience if you have any questions, you can write down the question in the chat box and our volunteers will take care of that and your question will be taken up at the end of the session so that we have a better uh, technical discussion uh, um, at the end and uh, there we can have sufficient time for the interaction with the experts uh, whom you will be listening to. So, uh, and uh, I thank Hansika uh, also for giving a, such a detailed introduction for me. So I'm really uh, thankful for that. So we start uh, the, uh, this session with the first talk that is uh, by Professor M. Shiva Kumar, the role of postal reservoir for the water security and flood hazard mitigation. Uh, Professor uh, Shiva Kumar has received his BSc Engineering at the University of Paradenia, Sri Lanka in, from 1972-1974. He also has an engineering from Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand from 1995-96 and completed his PhD from University of Newcastle, Australia uh, in 1981. He was also visiting professor and held the academic position of the University of Minnesota, USA, University of Heidelberg, Germany, Seyang University, China, and of course, my alma mater, Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Chennai, and Sri Shaya Sai University in India, and James Cook University, Queensland, Australia. Uh, his uh, uh, area of expertise is uh, water quality and the water resource engineering, pollutant export, from urban catchments, water and uh, based water treatment, environmental hydraulics and modeling and sediment transport. So I request uh, uh, Professor uh, M. Siva Kumar to start the discussion. 
Thank you, Professor Arya. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. You can. So, Professor Arya, Chairperson of the Plenary Session. I'm not sure whether Captain Dampake is there, who is the Dean of Engineering um, of, the, uh, of the KDU. Uh, my fellow Plenary Session speakers, uh, various members of the organizing committee and delegates, a very good afternoon and greetings from uh, Wollongong, Australia. I think I would like to give a special greeting to my one of my former colleagues uh, from Wollongong, Dr. Nedika Miguntana. I do see her in the list of participants, uh, who has been one of our best uh, sessional star, academic staff uh, at the University of Wollongong, which she won a number of awards, including Wattle Fellowship and the Vice Chancellor's Award for Teaching and Learning during her PhD tenure at Wollongong. I also wish to thank uh, right from the outset the, the Faculty of Engineering of, at KDU for inviting me to give this talk on the topic of coastal reservoirs. Uh, I hope this is an innovative topic and I hope that the, my presentation will fit the theme of the engineering plenary session. So let me um, give a, a bit of a summary of what uh, I plan to talk in terms of uh, uh, I'm obviously coming from several thousands of kilometers away, so I thought I'll give a one slide introduction of UOW, University of Wollongong, and I'll quickly take you all to into drivers of sustainability of water. I'm, I'm sure all of us are aware of water issues, and I hope it's not too far out for mechanical, electrical science people. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the need for coastal reservoirs. Uh, talk a little bit about water quality and then look at some two case studies, uh, one in South Korea and one of the recent work we have done as part of a PhD project. And I'll give some concluding remarks. And so if I can move on uh, to the next slide. Um, So, you know, University of Wollongong, uh, the city of Wollongong, as you see this picture, is a beautiful city. It's a coastal city about 80 kilometers south of Sydney in the east coast of Australia. We are a new university. We only uh, became an autonomous university in 75. Uh, so we, we are, it's a research intensive university. We are classed as the first 1% of world universities in the first 200 universities in the world for consistently for the last three, four years. Um, a mid-sized university in Australia, about 36,000 students. Uh, and we do have about 160,000 odd alumni from 184 countries, a truly international university. So that would be enough for, as a quick introduction to uh, University of Wollongong. But I would like to now take you to more of a very much a global issues in terms of sustainability. And, uh, and I'm sure that uh, almost all of you would be aware of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and SDG 6 mostly focus on um, sustainable water and sanitation to all people on earth. Uh, uh, and of course that the, most of the, all of these uh, Sustainable Development Goals are not in isolation. They are, depend on uh, energy, they depend on uh, climate change and many other uh, um, sustain, all the sustainable development goals are interconnected, but I want to focus just on water quantity and quality, uh, just to show that the amount of water demand globally is increasing about 1% per, per year, and we require another 20-30% more water. Uh, about 4 billion people currently uh, experiencing severe water scarcity at least one month of a year. It's, it's, uh, it's not only in developing nations, but also in developed nations, these type of water stress uh, happens, particularly in Australia, in, in some cities and towns. And of course, we do have floods and droughts. Uh, normally we have, and of course, climate change can uh, impact on that, and we need to look at mitigation and adaptation measures. In terms of water quality, uh, because of uh, uh, pollution in lakes, rivers, and groundwater systems, uh, and of course, excess pumping of groundwater, etc. with various activities, we have a uh, uh, decreasing amount of water available, and nearly 30% of the people don't have access to safe drinking water. Then switching back to water issue, uh, you know, water is uh, really considered to be blue gold, um, but it's, uh, it, it is under stress in many, many countries. This particular map, uh, uh, put forward by as part of the aqueduct project by World Resource Institute shows for 164 countries, um, 
and uh, there's about 17 countries, nearly a quarter of the world population is under what they call the baseline, extremely high baseline water stress. That means 80% of the time they're using almost all their allocated water, 80% of allocated water for the year uh, on an average they are using. That means they are going to be in trouble when there are uh, significant drought happens. Um, if I could uh, put the Australian context there that we are still a medium to high level baseline of stress. We are ranked about 50th uh, um, and Sri Lanka ranks 77th. Of course, in this ranking, if you have number one ranking, of course, you are in, uh, in severe problem with water stress. Um, so how much water we have uh, in terms of uh, um, for going around? So again, this is global uh, um, data, I guess, uh, in the last 100 years, you can see that uh, currently we require about 4 trillion meter cubed. A trillion is about 10 to the power 12 meter cubed or a thousand kilometer cubed of water for all purposes, this for agriculture, industrial, domestic, etc. And of course, in majority of the countries, it's used for agricultural purposes, uh, but world average is about 70%, but I'm sure in Sri Lanka, it's predominantly agricultural purposes to be used. So we require about 4 trillion meter cubed, but how much water we have? When you look at the annual water cycle, uh, um, it looks to me that, of course, there is water present in the, as precipitation, uh, pressure in the ocean, evaporation, etc. But in terms of surface flow running to the sea, uh, we have about 42 trillion meter cubed of water. Uh, so we just require just under 10% of this fresh water runoff. If you can capture that before it mixes to the seawater uh, and becomes salt water, I think we can supply everyone's need. Of course, that's a very simplistic way to put it, but uh, the, the, the point is that how do you capture and store this fresh water? Uh, if you look at uh, traditional capture of storing water is, uh, of course, there's a lot of surface dams, uh, uh, inland dams traditionally, uh, stored water, but they are in declining numbers, particularly large dams. They have a lifespan of 100 years uh, and uh, uh, there are issues with uh, sedimentation and a lot of social and environmental issues as well with uh, constructing new dams. So our suggestion, this is a work essentially done, uh, some of the work done in University of Wollongong, is that why can't we capture this water uh, which is running to the sea uh, about 42 trillion and we are only after about 10% by, uh, let's say that's a river which is coming and merging to the sea, then we put a barrier, which traditionally people have put, uh, uh, like uh, we'll talk about some uh, world examples, they would be called co first generation coastal reservoirs. But th this does have some implication in terms of capturing pollutants and uh, navigation and other issues, which are not all that good in this, but why not we do that, have an offline system and capturing depends on the uh, bathymetry and topography, what we call the second generation coastal reservoir. We capture the clean water. And of course, when there is a, a polluted water, it can be, or uh, less quality water can be discharged to the ocean. Uh, and of course, what we are after is 10% uh, of, the, of the total uh, water, but that's very, again, as I said, this is, uh, depends on the individual location. So what is a, a coastal reservoir? It's a reservoir inside a seawater, an off, uh, a reservoir inside a seawater, an offline of an estuary, harvesting runoff before discharging into the sea. So then before it mixes, becomes a uh, uh, you know, salt, uh, salty water. You can, uh, different locations you can think of, uh, uh, not only the dam can be in uh, concrete or earth or soft dam, uh, but we can also look at multi-purpose, not only for drinking, irrigation, uh, urban generation such as the Cardiff Reservoir in, in the UK, power production such as the Sea Mangan, which is uh, so if you have the right sort of tidal systems or industrial usage depending on water quality. So again, some divisions here in terms of uh, inland versus uh, coastal reservoirs. So usually in an inland reservoir, you go and trying to find a right in the upstream with some gorge or, or a plain reservoir, which uh, requires some large flooded area. Whereas here we are talking about, uh, uh, I think inside a river mouth or beside a river mouth or beyond a river mouth. So the concept is not that new. Uh, uh, this is a list of existing coastal reservoirs in the world. One of the earliest one is the Zuda Sea, which is in Netherlands. 
in the 1930s and uh, in, even in Australia, we do have Alexandrina Lake, which is a very large uh, coastal reservoir in 1939. We never refer to it as coastal reservoirs, but, uh, and then you can see the, the year completion as you progress down. Uh, we have the Marina Barrage in, in Singapore, uh, which is providing both uh, flood control and water supply purposes. And the largest coastal reservoir for water supplies is the one is in Ching Shanghai, Qinghaosha, Reservoir, which uh, supplies about seven and a half thousand megaliters a day of drinking water, and it satisfies forty percent of the Shanghai's population, uh, which is uh, twenty-five, uh, uh, nearly about ten million people. So maybe I'll show you a, a couple of uh, examples of coastal reservoirs worldwide. This is the Hong Kong coastal reservoir developed in the sixties. So this is what I call a first-generation coastal reservoir because you you just blocked off the the, the river uh, which is merging to the sea. Uh, and uh, I mentioned about this uh, Marina Barrage, which is uh, uh, shown there. Uh, you know, Singapore is a very well urbanized catchment, which they need to manage the catchment well. So they do have a barrage here. And of course, there are some fancy operations in terms of low tide. Uh, they can actually, uh, uh, these gates can be opened. Uh, and uh, there's also underneath uh, you can have gates and be open. But if there's a high uh, tide, which doesn't allow the high to go and flood the area. Uh, and of course, uh, they do have pumpings, uh, large scale pumpings. Uh, South Korea has a coastal reservoir. There are some issues which I'll discuss. Uh, uh, it started with the water supply reservoir, but then it was abandoned and then they uh, decided to generate uh, uh, tidal power. So this is the uh, Lake Alexandrina, Lake Albert, uh, sort of natural lakes, but by uh, putting these a number of barrages at the end before it goes uh, to the out in the Southern Ocean, in the Murray Mouth. Uh, um, so th these uh, uh, lakes has become coastal reservoirs. Uh, I just want to point out that this, uh, uh, there, there is a city of Adelaide not far from here. And, uh, you know, there's potentially uh, water can be supplied from these uh, lakes to, uh, to the reservoir, uh, to, to Adelaide. Uh, so we have done some modeling work on, on this regard. But uh, in the interest of time, I will only talk about just uh, those two specific uh, examples. So the other coastal reservoir, which I mentioned, is the uh, Qinghaosha, the Shanghai Coastal Reservoir, which essentially right on the... Um, uh, on the, uh, on the southern branch of the Yangtze River, one of the big river system, discharges to the uh, East uh, China Sea there. And they have uh, an island where they have created that uh, uh, offline coastal reservoir, something like this. Uh, and then this is the exact picture. I was uh, fortunate to really visit this reservoir a couple of times actually now. And uh, so, uh, so very well functional. Uh, uh, freshwater reservoir at the uh, at the Yangtze estu estuary. Okay, so that would be enough for for uh, introduction to type of coastal reservoirs. Let's see what are the problems uh, a reservoir can have. If you put a coastal reservoir at the end of a catchment, uh, of course, it, everything what happens in the upstream is going to be eventually coming into the coastal reservoir. So whether it's uh, organics generated from uh, forest. Uh, or sediments from rural runoff, agricultural practices, nutrients, toxic chemicals, depends on where the industries are situated, or intense farming practices, or in urban catchment, a uh, whole range of emerging pollutants. All of them really can be uh, collected and then uh, you know, end up uh, if you have a reservoir at the end. So it's important to ensure that we are aware of those and then how to overcome those uh, um, uh, negative aspects of it. So that's what happens in this uh, Shiva coastal reservoir in South Korea? They started uh, in the 1987 construction and completed in 2001. Uh, and um, these satellite images show how those construction took place, but they did uh, abandon the concept of water supply. Uh, and I'll show you a few slides to show why, what has happened there so that we can learn from the past. But uh, they have been successful in making uh, tidal power. Uh, so it works as a tidal power, but not as a water supply system. So what happens in, in this Lake uh, Shiva coastal reservoir is that the upstream has a number of catchments. So this diagram uh, shows the, the, the sub catchments of these areas. 
and they do have different land uses, industrial, residential, commercial, agricultural, forest, and others. And you could see that in this uh, 4TG, which is a, a fair uh, catchment very close to the lake, there is a 60% industrial uh, land use. And, uh, and if you don't manage that well, of course, you're going to run into problems. So they have done some studies. This is uh, pr uh, subsequently the starting of uh, the coastal reservoir and, and shows that some uh, time varying uh, uh, flow information they have captured uh, on a, uh, on a uh, let's say, um, on a continual basis. What is the flow coming of that uh, particular industrial catchment 4TG and uh, uh, suspended solids, total nitrogen, these are contaminants, uh, sus uh, chemical oxygen demand and nitrogen and phosphorus. And you could see that uh, it depends on whether industrial catchment, urban catchment, there are different types of pollutants which are uh, in, uh, uh, in place, particularly in the uh, industrial catchment. There is uh, also what we call the first flush so that uh, contaminants which accumulate get flushed off as well. They've also done some, uh, the same uh, monitoring was done for agricultural and uh, uh, agricultural forest and agricultural um, uh, aspect of it and agriculture, forest and forest agriculture. And again, uh, you can see the nitrogen and phosphorus. There are three, uh, these ingredients for plant growth and one need to be aware of how much you are exporting them. And finally, they also looked at the water and sediment for trace organic contaminants. These are from industrial processes such as uh, PCBs and PHS and nanoplastics, etc. And they found that uh, there is enough contamination not only in water, but although they are at very low concentration, uh, that some of these chemicals can be very toxic for both uh, humans and animals. So the key messages from that particular study is that uh, non-point source pollution with coming from different land uses can be a, contribu a significant contributor to catchment transport. We need to understand the contaminant loads, the type and uh, amount of contaminants. And also if there is a significant industrial area adjacent to a potential CR for water supply should have been a red flag. And both sediments and uh, uh, water became polluted. So that's first case study. The second case study I like to look at is that this is what part of a PhD study we have done recently. Uh, CR option for Brisbane River. Brisbane is a city, it's the capital of uh, uh, Queensland, one of our state. And then here we want to look at a, a coastal reservoir at the mouth of the Brisbane River for two purposes. One is to, to see whether this coastal reservoir can reduce floods. And the second one is, of course, store water for water supply purposes. So this uh, diagram shows where Brisbane is. That's uh, again on the east coast of Australia, uh, the bottom part of Queensland. And of course, this is the, the catchment uh, uh, shown there. And then we are going to look at uh, right in this uh, near Brisbane Bar, we are going to put a coastal reservoir. And this is Brisbane River upstream. And the city is situated about 14 kilometers upstream of the river. And then there are many other cities and uh, measuring locations as well. Now, uh, Brisbane River has a, a uh, a drought history, uh, uh, particularly for, you know, there are measured uh, information for over 200 years now. There are 10 spells of very significant drought, and the most significant one is uh, what we call a 10 year drought or nine year drought. We had, we call the millennium drought. Uh, and during that period, uh, the, uh, the combined dam capacity in that region in 2007 came to only 17%, and that's very, very little there for various purposes. So there is a drought problem. There's also a flood problem. Um, there are some seven major floods uh, occurred in, uh, in the Brisbane city, uh, but particularly the 2011 flood is a very significant one. There were 36 deaths, 20,000 homes flooded with uh, significant uh, business inundation from the pictures you could see that, and of course, 3.25 billion worth of damages. And of course, as you all know that uh, with uh, climate change and other things, these type of intense storms can even uh, come more frequently. So that's one issue, flood, flooding, but also they are looking for other ways of in, in which uh, they can uh, supply water demand for the uh, growing population because the water demand is increasing and the dams, uh, existing dams are losing capacity. And uh, in Australia, because of social and environmental grounds, it's very difficult to get new dams built. 
So these are the major water infrastructures uh, in, in that particular catchment. So that's the Brisbane River. Uh, uh, it's winding way up. Uh, there are two dams, uh, Heinz and Wyvern Dam for flood control and for water supply purposes. There's a water treatment plant, there's a waste water treatment plant. They, they do treat water and then reuse. And then we are trying to propose a, a coastal reservoir at the mouth, of the, the offline coastal reservoir at the mouth. One of the problem uh, with these dams is that uh, the, the, the dams cannot, can only control flood upstream. It cannot control the flood downstream, and, and, but 50% of the catchment area is downstream of the dam. And also, unfortunately, city of Brisbane is also situated in a flood plain. So we looked at uh, uh, different uh, models, but eventually we chose on the Mike modeling suit in terms of uh, trying to model a, a coastal hydrodynamics uh, of the river as well as the coastal reservoir. There's a whole range of uh, uh, data collection and uh, data analysis involved. I won't go into that detail uh, in the interest of time. So I will just give you some results. Uh, so the MIC21 model is a two-dimensional hydrodynamic model where we try to simulate what the quantity, which is what is generated in the river, um, and also what is uh, how it uh, uh, interacts with the with the with the bay, as you can see in the blue. That's uh, the Moreton Bay. We also have to look at the water quality aspect, uh, particularly salinity, and uh, the aim is to uh, ensure that the water levels, the depth, the velocity the flood extent can be simulated as well as the salinity. And then uh, how much time, uh, what sort of flow is needed to flush the salinity uh, uh, saline water into the, into the bay. It's important if you want to capture clean water. So for that, we, we, we took two uh, different flood conditions. One is that we look at the uh, 2013 flood and uh, we try to calibrate that flood, uh, the, the, the Mike model, uh, the MIG-21 model for different locations. Uh, uh, Jindali Alert is uh, upstream uh, of uh, Brisbane City, then Brisbane City, and also downstream of Brisbane City. You can see those more like the tidal influence. Um, so we calibrated and found that this uh, the observe and simulation is working quite well. And then with an independent data set, we validated that for the next... Um, sorry, wait. We validated with the 2011 flood, uh, and then it looks like uh, they are, uh, you know, our um, simulation seems to work very well. So once uh, the, the model is calibrated, we have tried to apply for coastal reservoir operation. So here we, um, we build, uh, or this is a, obviously a proposal, we built a, a large coastal reservoir with uh, two, three gates operations so that the gate A can be closed uh, if there is any significant uh, you know, tidal influence and uh, during the flood, uh, maybe we can capture the water. And of course, uh, if there is necessary, they can also discharge back to the bay. So this is uh, so the operation of gates A, B and C are important. So this uh, uh, is a very large reservoir, even larger than the Chinkausa uh, reservoir for water supply, because now we are talking about for flood control. So we looked at about uh, 900 uh, gigaliters of uh, a large reservoir like that. And then we tried to do some simulations uh, and showed that if we can capture uh, that much water, of course, uh, we can uh, reduce the flood level uh, from the maximum to moderate to even to very minor flood levels. So under normal operation, that is just the coastal reservoir operating, uh, depends on when you start opening the gate and closing the gate and depends on the tidal conditions, etc. Uh, it's possible that we can reduce the flood level by constructing a water a reservoir by 15%. But if we can jointly operate with an upstream dam in the, in the appropriate manner, we can even reduce the water levels to even 30% uh, from the maximum height. Now, these have significant uh, implications to uh, a, a Brisbane city uh, so that, uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure can be saved by having a 30% reduction. In terms of water supply, it's important to look at the salinity, uh, salinity aspects. And then we look at uh, also the model has to uh, calibrate for salinity. We had some data for 2008 uh, and the salinity of course uh, uh, goes up to about 80 kilometers upstream of the river. And we, the same way we calibrated and validated for an independent data set. And then we ran different uh, simulations 
and we found that uh, suppose if the river is flowing at 50 meter cube per second, the freshwater seawater interface is really about 80 kilometers upstream. And you require at least about 150 meter cube per second of flow to drive this salinity right down to the mouth so that it can be captured in the uh, coastal reservoir for water supply. So the, um, we also looked at the uh, freshwater fl flushing dam, how much time it takes to flush out this uh, um, saline water. And then we found that for different flow rates uh, and different size of coastal reservoirs, uh, you find that, let's say, if you have 150 meter cube per second for about 39 days, which can store 100 gigaliters of water of, uh, uh, you know, uh, fresh water quality. And uh, so, uh, so it depends on the type of application, whether it's uh, water supply purposes or flood control purposes, you can really use a, a coastal reservoir for appropriately. So this is sort of the first time we are showing that uh, a downstream storage can help an upstream uh, uh, problem. So the key messages there from the study too is that uh, Brisbane city uh, experienced significant flooding and uh, the model shows that if we, if we build a second generation offline coastal reservoir, we can reduce the flood by 15%. But if you operate with the upstream dams, we can reduce the flood by 30%. Uh, and also we have found out how much time it takes to flush out the, the salinity uh, at a particular uh, river flow. Um, I do have one more slide to sort of give uh, an illustration of, uh, I did say in my in the abstract that I'll give uh, some comments about the Sri Lanka uh, river basin. Uh, so this is, uh, you can call it the back of the envelope calculations where, you know, it's, um, uh, you know, Sri Lanka is blessed with quite a bit of rainfall. I mean, Australian average rainfall is about under 600 millimeters. We have, uh, you have here 2,147 uh, millimeter rainfall. Uh, your amount of you are discharging to the sea is about 50 uh, kilometer cubed. But uh, I do know that your water demand is, uh, you know, maybe again, less than 10%. Uh, so, uh, and there's a fair amount of runoff goes into to the sea. In Australia, our runoff rainfall ratio uh, is 0.09, but you have 0.39. So I would say that uh, there's significant potential exist in, um, in Sri Lanka for coastal reservoirs. Now, if uh, anyone is interested, we have published a, a couple of, uh, uh, you know, one book recently by Elsevier, or it's published through the Butterworth Heinemann uh, on, on uh, sustainable water resource development for coastal reservoirs, and also some journal articles on, uh, particularly about this Brisbane study. So let me conclude uh, uh, with a slide saying that the population growth, economic expansion and climate change uh, and associated problems, including floods and droughts, are putting increasing pressure on to find sustainable water solutions. As many cities in the, are, are situated near coastal areas, in fact, 50% of the world population now live in coastal areas. In Australia, is about 85%. We, uh, we should look for suitable coastal reservoirs uh, designed properly, which, so that you can alleviate multiple problems, such as water supply, flood protection. And also, it, uh, you can maintain environment flows. If you have too many dams, that pre uh, prevents uh, environmental flows to uh, not, not enough environmental flows. But we should be aware of the contaminants uh, and we need to take uh, appropriate precautions. So first generation code, uh, coastal reservoirs are, are, are a problem. So we need to go for a second generation coastal reservoirs, which uh, I've given uh, the second uh, example, such as what in, uh, in Brisbane. So, uh, but in all of these cases, we should also look into environmental and social aspects because it is a very major infrastructure. So at this point, I stop and acknowledge my, some of my PhD students and my colleague there uh, at the School of Civil Mining and Environmental Engineering. Thank you very much, Professor Arya. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Professor Shiva Kumar, and a very useful and a very informative uh, discussion on a very important problem, um, which uh, almost uh, uh, every country uh, is facing uh, in the present day. This uh, drought problem, as well as the uh, um, even more severe problem, is the um, drinking water problem. And uh, through your lecture, we got uh, idea that how these problem could be handled 
through the uh, first of the lawyers. Uh, now we move to the next speaker of uh, um, this plenary session. Um, audience, please uh, um, write down your questions uh, in the chat box so that later on we can um, take your questions. And, and if time permits, we'll give you the time to have interaction. So, um, so next uh, speaker of the uh, day, Professor uh, uh, Cecil Kumar Wadu. Uh, he will be speaking on the institutional collaboration and end user uh, involvement for guaranteed socioeconomic empowerment through research and innovation. Uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Cecil is the senior professor in electrical engineering uh, at the Department of Electrical Engineering, University of uh, Morotua. And uh, he has uh, got his BSc honors in electrical engineering uh, with first class honors in 1996 from university of in the, from the same university and he obtained uh, m engineering from advanced system and control engineering and phd in robotics and intelligence systems in 2000 and 2003 respectively from sage national university japan uh, and he was with the intelligent transport system research center and cto taiwan at the republic of china as a postdoctoral research fellow uh, he has sold, authored of two books and portal two books and published uh, 37 refereed international general papers and conference papers over the past um, few years. He has been serving as a uh, uh, reviewer of highly recognized international generals uh, on uh, such as IEEE transaction on the transport system, IEEE transaction on main system man and cybernetics, uh, IEEE transaction on cybernetic energy and environment control intelligence system. General of Lights of Computing, and many more. Uh, he, uh, he has been, uh, uh, his uh, notable IPC involvement include the 8th International Conference on Smart Cities and Green ICT System, 12th International Conference on Sensor Technologies and Applications, IEEE International Conference on SMC, IEEE International Conference on ICNCA, uh, Indian International Conference on AI and uh, International Conference on ISSNP, IEEE, ICIE, AF, etc. Uh, in 2008, Professor Maravadu was biographized in Marcus Huizhu, uh, 25th Silver Anniversary Edition of Huizhu in the world. And he is recipient of JC, Top Outstanding Young Person Award, Academic Leadership and Accomplishment in 2009 in Sri Lanka. Sri Lankan Education Leadership Award of the World Education Council in 2019, Presidential Award for Scientific Research Publications in 2007 and 2009. He is currently uh, involved. Uh, Uh, with the
Am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, Professor. Ah, yeah. So now I request, uh, uh, sorry if I, there are some uh, network glitches on my side. Uh, now I request Professor Cecil to start the discussion. Professor Cecil, are you there? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please continue. Am I audible now? Yes, yes. we can hear you very well. Right. There is an echo coming. Is it... uh, okay. Um... Just check, are you uh, uh, connected by two devices? All right. Um, I hope uh, I'm, I'm audible now. Yes, we can hear. Thank you very much. I will. Um, um, what I the the, the topic uh, I have selected uh, for today's conference um, is a non-technical topic, particularly because after looking at the the theme of the conference, I thought of. Um, discussing some inherent uh, issues and particularly um, with the emphasis on how to guarantee and enhance the socioeconomic impact, the empowerment of, of the research efforts that uh, in Sri Lanka we put in uh, in the universities and also we, we have dedicated research institutions. Um, a non-technical topic for a change, um, because if you look at the uh, KDU uh, International Research Conference 2021, uh, the theme, um, sustaining the national growth uh, through ingenuity and innovation in the new normal, but I also saw in a different place, uh, security and stability 
and the development um, in the new new normal. So, anyway, uh, it's 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 fair enough to say that um, development, security, and stability uh, highly interrelated. So, it's very important to ensure that um, the uh, uh, the unemployability problems, the, uh, the life quality of humans, these factors are addressed to ensure security and stability. So, the what as the research uh, institutions and the universities that are conducting research, uh, how to align these research efforts in a way, the, uh, the funding, the human resource that is um, spent is finally producing the um, research outcomes that bring about a change and um, uplifting of the living standards of people in one way or the other. Now, when it comes to the Sri Lanka scenario, the problems are well understood. We have, um, numerous um, problems that can be solved, that can be given engineering technology solutions. And at the same time, we have people with qualifications, international experience, exposure, who can solve the problems. And they are, uh, they are well interconnected with the international research community if they are respective areas. Um, however, uh, in my opinion, the, the most of the research efforts uh, stops at um, uh, publishing a couple of journal papers or, or, or a PhD or MPhil uh, research thesis. In that way, um, it's, it's hard to argue that the justice is done to, to contribute to the national economic growth through the research and innovation. So, Particularly, I would like to um, highlight these uh, some issues, how to improve that, uh, uh, this uh, particular aspect. Um, however, if you look at the, uh, the, the technical, my, my technical area, the mostly I've been talking about climate change and building uh, energy uh, optimization, the building, the smart green buildings. Now, if you look at, uh, we heard the climate change and the droughts and, and the flooding in our previous con the, the presentation. So this is an, uh, an image, how the glaciers are melting in the North Pole and in the Greenland um, due to climate change. So what happens is when these uh, glaciers are melting, the water levels go up. Um, and it is estimated that if this melting continues in the current rate, the water levels to rise as much as six point. temperature profiles in the water, the, the sea is completely affected by this, uh, what is happening in here. So that uh, makes the hot weather extremely hot and the cold weather extremely cold. And if you look at the, the temperatures in, in Sri Lanka, Colombo during August, August is, um, is usually a warm month. It is, the, it is the summertime to the Northern Hemisphere. And you can expect the, the humid, quite warm temperature condition in, in Colombo. But but uh, last couple of years, if you if you have noticed, it is it's not the case. It's quite cold in here during the during the month of August, September. So yeah, it's relatively comfortable, but it may not be a, a good news. Now we can see uh, how bad the situation is. Now, the 
uh, the uh, the energy uh, one of the main reasons is the the methods we use to produce electricity are environmentally unfriendly now if you look at this result that is published actually uh, a couple of years back uh, in um, the green building council newsletter in sri lanka this result actually it's available in the internet for you to for you to go through for 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 further detail this is a study carried out in indonesia in jakarta by green building council indonesia in collaboration with the world bank they considered nine green certified buildings in jakarta and they compared the um the utility costs with the standard buildings that are not green certified and found that this green certified building is saving 30 to 80% of the annual utility costs compared to the standard buildings that is at the additional cost of 0 to 17% of construction cost investment see this um, when you look at this 0 to 17% i would like to draw your attention to 0 um zero corresponds to 30% the the savings the, if we want to go as achieve as much as 80% of the utility cost savings yeah there's a significant amount of um, initial investment in the construction project now these um resources uh, coming from the earth and then um, resource efficiency uh, contributes to saving the environment now this zero percent additional construction cost means by simply being uh, resource conscious during the design phase you can save as much as 30% let alone 30% 20% that is huge uh, particularly if you look at um, in many countries 30 to 40% of the energy consumption is uh, attributed to the buildings buildings the commercial industrial and residential buildings are responsible for as much as 30 to 40% of the and then uh, if you look at the hvac systems for instance um in a building commercial building hvac systems responsible for again 30 to 40% of the building energy consumption we look at 30% 30% out of 30% is, is almost 10% and if you can save as much as this by taking various uh, there are numerous things that can be done a policy point of view and implementation point of view awareness point of view we can shut down some power plants so in in a country we are talking about you know the best optimal energy mix generation planning but uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the demand side management uh, is a, is a factor that has been ignored i think uh, in, need uh, more attention in sri lanka and many other countries um i tell you one example and um, oh, i was in uh, in um, manila recently attending event at the um, asian development bank now this hotel building and the the room i stayed in just two hours of cooling was sufficient for me to sustain the the comfortable environment in the room for next couple of days i don't think i spent a lot of time inside the room however um maybe 50 50 the important point is um adult human person emits about 30 watts of heat 30 joules per second that's not much and ideally if you are the only heat emitting object inside a inside a indoor indoor space and you should be the only the thermal load to the air conditioning system however what happens is most of the air conditioning systems are busy removing the heat leakages than the heat generated by the uh, the thermal loads in the indoor spaces you can do a simple experiment just um, in your 
in your office room or in your home if the room is air conditioned turn off the air conditioner if the temperature inside starts to rise into un unbearable levels within within 30 40 seconds maybe minutes that means there's a serious problem with regard to the design of the building the thermal uh, thermal design of the building so to achieve as far as 80 percent you have to start uh, the from the uh, architectural design uh, stage architectural design in a resource optimal manner the building envelope the orientation whatever the vertical gardens so on and so forth that's possible and then comes the civil engineering design particularly the material selection and then thermal insulation levels in the building number four is the building services design the um, energy optimal design of the building services and the design optimization number four is energy-based control so how to make um your building smart or intelligent uh, in that when it operates the building services it it operates in a way the energy consumption is minimum all the time so using maybe complex optimization algorithms while maintaining the user comfort health and safety there's no no compromise on it so um this is a very exciting research topic that uh, we can we have to uh, encourage in the universities and and the academia uh, you know at a time looking for progress and prosperity in um, uh, in the in the local sense and also in the in the global sense now um, in sri lanka we are uh, particularly uh, thinking about 70% renewables integration in the national energy grid so this gives uh, created new opportunities for the researchers um, when you talk about uh, renewables rich low carbon uh, sustainable future when the renewables share in the national grid keeps increasing uh, such a grid naturally imposes several technical challenges to the grid operators um, so this is uh, mainly uh, because to to ensure continued system reliability and optimized energy economics due to the variability and intermittency of the re renewable sources particularly wind and solar pv systems uh, the reduced systems inertia because the the you're you're losing the luxury of uh, this uh, what you call synchronous generator based inertia and of course the the increased voltage sensitivity so this has led to what you call security constrained unit commitment and economic dispatch in in modern day uh, power systems where most of the countries are experiencing ever increasing share of renewables energy generation in the national grid now with the increasing share of renewables uh, sources in a national grid, the economically optimal grid operation with uh, guaranteed uh, system stability uh, must consider the, the most up-to-date load, renewable forecast, uh, generation unit status, system inertia and voltage profiles. Now, this requires real-time processing of relevant information received via the granular uh, telemetry uh, from all the resources. Now, these, the latest trends have, uh, have given new opportunities for the academia and the, and the research institutions to to think about when you, when when uh, these institutions are writing the research proposals and also 
the funding agencies in releasing the research grants to ensure that the research efforts are very much the um, uh, oriented towards uh, the, the solving the current and near future uh, uh, the, the national problems. So um, the distributed flexible resources going to be very important issue because it's, it's, it's a, it's a well-known fact, uh, the latest uh, research findings that grid scale um, storage is, is not an easy problem to solve. It's one of the most challenging problems to solve and it's expensive. This is the reason why the distributed uh, flexible resources that can respond when and then and there as required in terms of frequency response. And um, in case of a contingency, when uh, large generation trips uh, that can lead to a very high rate of change of frequency in the renewables rich grid. And of course, the peak shaving. Peak shaving uh, and the economic dispatch, in, in the face of the technical challenges, these are opportunities that are created in a renewables rich grid. So that requires real time energy market, real time pricing, and uh, cloud based uh, energy aggregation systems, and models, and implementation. So um, now uh, the implementation of such systems become increasingly possible, feasible, because of the, the, the explosive growth uh, in IoT and the cloud computing technology. So if you look at the buildings, buildings um, resource efficiency, building, building automation, um, uh, there is a new domain that is building Internet of Things that is specially designed, specially customized Internet of Things schemes for applications in, in, in large commercial buildings. Now, we are talking about uh, in, in, in large commercial fully automated uh, buildings, automated for energy and resource efficiency and operational efficiency, as well as um, renewables rich energy grid, where you will have to uh, have real time monitoring, assessment and decision making and, and communication between many, uh, many parties that are that that involves in the uh, in the operational and the, and the business aspects, real time. So that involves real-time telemetry and communications between tens of thousands of hard hardware points, the interconnected devices. So as a result, we see the power systems becoming increasingly multidisciplinary. So that creates an opportunity for the de departments in the university to, to, uh, to co-work and to collaborate in multidisciplinary uh, research projects. So, the timely topics when it comes to um, this particular development, the renewables integration with the target of 70% renewable energy in the national grid that has created many uh, timely topics that the universities and research institutions can, can explore, can investigate. Smart battery storage systems, to mitigate intermittency and achieve the peak shaving. Energy uh, informatics and cyber, cyber security. You can see it is becoming increasingly interdisciplinary research areas. And um, renewable generation forecasting one day ahead and real time going to be very, very important to address the issue of intermittency and, uh, um, and also so that the, the grid operators can plan ahead enough in advance the unit commitment and make realistic estimates about the grid inertia levels. So 
the the key point here is that renewable generation is highly unpredictable however there are research going on and very promising results have been obtained in terms of the forecasting accuracy however the conditions in in sri lanka we know the the weather conditions and the other uh, the affecting factors are different so therefore it's it's important to do relevant research taking into account the local conditions and and the situations into account now cloud based platforms to aggregate distributed flexible resources so it's is is based on uh, a real time energy market and uh, energy aggregation uh, models and vehicle to grid and grid to vehicle technologies to use electric vehicles as distributed flexible uh, storage because uh, by 2030 the number of number of vehicles particularly the passenger cars on the roads expected to be a third to 40% of the passenger cars are expected to, to be plug in electric so the idea here is to to charge your electric vehicle after 10:30 pm when the cost of electricity is is the cheapest and the, the grid is running at the off peak and discharge this energy when the grid required it most for example during the peak hours maybe charge at a lower cost lower rate discharge at a higher rate so these business models will be in place um inevitably when we are so committed to uh, 70% of renewables uh, uh, integration in the grid a lot of optimism on using the car batteries um reuse of the car batteries in the grid scale energy storage applications and uh, you know uninterruptible power supplies this is another promising research area we can pay attention to the lithium ion particularly the electric vehicle battery recycling and reuse is going to be a big uh, uh, very important timely topic to to explore so the demand response are uh, driven real time energy market strategies so therefore this is the it's all about uh, energy tariff structures but that are very dynamic so such devices in such uh, methods will require uh, complex algorithms and particularly we see the uh, the researchers working on this area using uh, artificial intelligence based uh, methods uh, heavily to come up with meaningful uh, uh, real time energy market strategies so the when it comes to this intermittency and fluctuation this kind of a simple method this is a full day uh, scenario however this is possible you know 5 minutes 10 minutes intervals the the idea is to use the forecasting algorithms to identify the dispatch base point that is the guaranteed dispatch that you can you can commit to to the grid operator the balance amount to store in the storage systems batteries and then discharge that amount during the peak hours so that solves um, numerous problems now when it comes to the universities and the research institutions particularly after my um, appointment as the chairman of the board of governors of the one of the research institutes i have noticed this issue we can see the universities in the country are, are primarily devised designed to produce the human resource and the full time research support staff and the infrastructure available are generally on the par as a result the academic staff the researchers on in the universities have to work with um, the students so that limits the research output seriously and on the other hand there are research institutes 
research institutes um, are not attracting quality human resource with, uh, with research experience exposure, international experience and exposure particularly. So you can see there's a serious issue here. The universities attract the best academics and researchers uh, with, um, with uh, the most qualified, the research qualified with international experience and exposure, and they come and join the universities. The universities are not devised uh, to, uh, to, uh, for, for, for research these researchers to work with the students. When the students, you know, they write their thesis and, and, and leave the university, sometimes that's as far as the research goes. This is the reason why these institutions have to collaborate. Now, there is uh, something um, I'm trying, but uh, the, the thing is, if you look at the research institutions, there are dedicated staff, dedicated engineers. They are really good at realizing uh, your designs. So, so that, that solves the problem of having to work with part-time um, the students who, who leave after graduation in the universities. Now, uh, this is a very important issue that, uh, the country has to look after. The first such project I started in collaboration with University of Morotua, this is uh, done at Arthur C. Clark Institution. Um, a doctor with a PhD in, uh, in biomedical instrumentation, uh, he, he graduated with flying colors in the US, winning the best uh, PhD thesis award and so on. I got him connected with Arthur C. Clarke Institute and they, they came up with this result within six months. It is possible, this wouldn't have been possible at the university alone because these, these doctors will have to work with the students. That is, um, and, and even the infrastructure is, is limited as you know. And the research institute alone wouldn't have achieved such achievement because as I mentioned, there are very rare the, the, the experts with field expertise. You need field expertise to achieve uh, something, something special. And this is successfully field tested. And um, the preliminary testing is successful. You can see uh, it's been tested in a laboratory environment at the KDU. The results are successful. So this is a rapid COVID-19 test device. Now, if you look at, this is a, a promising result. Now, uh, to take these examples as, um, as uh, good examples, um, to, to encourage the, the universities, institutions to collaborate is very, very important. I think it is the, is the high time for everyone to look beyond the publication oriented, what you call, call blue sky research. Now, I think it's, it's, it's highlighted again and again at the inauguration ceremony in the morning. Now, I can remember the vice chancellor is talking about producing graduates with knowledge expertise and a character. The, this character factor becomes extremely important when you want to take your research beyond the prototype. Doing a prototype model, coming up with some experimental results and writing a technical paper, that is very luxur luxurious thing to do. You can do it within the, in, inside the university with the students and so on. But if you want to commercialize these products and systems, take the systems to the hands of the end user, generate income to the university, to the country, negotiate and strike a business deal with the investor, a mass, mass manufacturer. That requires that character. That is exactly the character I think the KDU Vice Chancellor is talking about this morning. So I invite everyone to, to, uh, to, to have this, the mindset and to think about taking your research beyond publishing a couple of papers and, and, and putting together a MSc or a PhD thesis. 
Now, these are some other projects that I am um, planning at the Research Institute, for instance. Uh, we have estimated that there are about 100,000 split type air conditioning units in the, in the government institutions alone. Now, there are not only the initial cost factor, but the maintenance and repairs. The poor maintenance and repairs seriously reduces the lifespan of these devices. And I'm, I'm, I'm planning to, I have already planned a, a national level, level project where the universities and the research institutions are doing the research. You have to continuously upgrade and update these technologies in terms of the, uh, the performance and the energy efficiency and the durability, etc. And to, to, to get the, um, the assemblers distributed all over the country, there are small businesses that are doing the assembly to the, to the picture. And then to have a, a national level um, uh, arm for installation, repairs and maintenance. So, it's, so you can see it's a triangular partnership that will save the foreign exchange that will create job opportunities. I think it's high time to think about this kind of projects. Another project that we thought about that's the picture at the center is a, is a speed gun used by the traffic police. So again, not only the initial cost, but maintenance and the calibration. So the, the after sales, the, the issues are predominantly a matter of concern. And this kind of research unit can, can make a difference. Now, there's a, um, a lot of talking these days in terms of the policy and initiatives uh, about the uh, fertilizer. This is a fertilizer machine. The fertilizer machines will be required that is uh, in, in, in large numbers and for forever. So these kind of projects, not only, well, you, will, you may not uh, publish high, you know, high impact factor journals, but the socioeconomic impact will be extremely high. Now, the concluding remarks, the, uh, it's very important to align the R&D efforts towards the timely and relevant issues, the research topics at the university and research institutes, and giving high priority uh, topics, uh, uh, priority when issuing research grants, and also even recognizing their research efforts. We know that there are uh, outstanding research performance awards, etc. The end user involvement that the importance of the end user involvement and the channeling the massive human resource mostly doing the blue sky research at the universities i know the department i'm attached to there are 40 40 full-time researchers you can imagine such a massive human resource high quality human research with um, excellent research skills uh, mostly i'm not saying everybody involved in highly theoretical, what you call a blue sky research without end user involvement. If you can make use of that human resource to a nationally important research projects, just imagine how much difference such initiative can make. This is 40 full time at one department. If you look at all the engineering faculties in the country, that should be um, quite a quite a large number, thousands maybe maybe few hundreds or close to 1000 can be can can well be 2000 i haven't thought about it and strong institutional collaborations to bring about the synergy and and meaningful project results so uh, this um i would like to highlight and um, i i hope uh, um my uh, time is up. I would like to wind up with this point. Uh, I would like to discuss further and basically uh, with emphasis of how to channel the research efforts, the human resource and the other resources we put in. 
in a way, the research outcomes finally contributes to the national economic development and making the lives better of the people. Yeah, particularly, that's important at this uh, moment in the in the history, uh, while we are experiencing a pandemic that we haven't seen uh, ever before at this scale. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Cecil, uh, for a very informative and, uh, in fact, addressing a very important problem, uh, which, uh, in fact, uh, need to be dealt with uh, everyone. Uh, particularly, uh, I just like a quick comment here that uh, particularly my request to all my uh, fellow researchers, at least who have reached to the position of the professors, where now the uh, publication do not matter them. They should definitely try with their research groups to take up the um, real life problems and to provide to develop the solution for them so that uh, we can contribute uh, to the society we can address to the society problem in terms of the researchers. Thank you very much, Professor Cecil, for a very important and very informative lecture. Now, we move to the next speaker of this session, uh, is, uh, Professor so Pereira. Uh, he will be speaking on enterprise application of uh, construction industry in new normals. Uh, professor uh, Asok Pereira is a senior pro uh, professor and the head of the Department of Transport and Logistic Management at uh, University of Moratua. Uh, professor uh, Pereira has got his uh, uh, BSc in engineering honors from University of Moratua in 1984 and then MSc in construction from at Logborough University of Technology, UK in 1986. His PhD, again in construction management from the same university in 1990. In 1999, he earned the Fulbright Fellowship Award, Fulbright Foundation USA. In addition to serving as a course coordinator for several postgraduate degree programs, he also served as head construction engineering and management department of civil engineering at University of Moratova. Professor Asok Pereira is a chartered engineer and member of Station of Engineers Sri Lanka. His specialties include project management, <laughs> management information system, e-learning, enterprise resource planning, construction cost estimating, cost effective building materials and methods, and also the forensic engineering. Now, now I request Professor Pereira to uh, start the discussion. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Prasad, yeah, thank you very much uh, for kind words uh, giving the introduction, uh, my fellow uh, speakers. And uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this conference and uh, staff and uh, students as well, and uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me start my presentation. Can you, somebody confirm that you can see my presentation? Uh, yeah, it's and, visible and your voice is audible. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, looking at the, the topic of the, the conference uh, and as well as this session, uh, I felt it very appropriate uh, talking about the uh, new normal uh, and as well as, you know, the associated factors and as well as, you know, uh, always uh, these sort of things are opportunities for us to learn from each other and uh, I'm quite enjoying the, the, uh, the two uh, speakers uh, and listen to them and as well as I look forward for the, the next one as well, uh, as well as the question time. Uh, so I selected uh, to share with uh, you uh, enterprise application of construction industry in the new normal. Uh, why I selected is uh, this is a research area that I've been involved uh, uh, 
uh, doing uh, uh, research in the recent past, particularly last 10 years. Uh, and as well as, uh, uh, even though we are locked down, uh, by, uh, then uh, uh, with the involvements with the industry, uh, I saw certain uh, other aspects uh, which I thought uh, to get with my research findings in this area to share at this moment. Uh, so, so it will be uh, both uh, research and as well as uh, sort of uh, something that I learned uh, uh, during one and a half years. Uh, sometimes, you know, partly locked down, completely locked down, back to sort of some normal work, but again back to lockdown now. Uh, so, uh, but I saw the industry struggle. Uh, as well as I uh, quite agree with uh, Professor Cecil Kumaravadu, you know, yeah, if we do a lot of research uh, and, but if there's no application, uh, then sometimes you wonder what is the impact that you're going to make. Uh, so uh, this is a sort of a challenge that, uh, that all of us have. Uh, to some extent, uh, I'm happy that uh, uh, some of the research that I was involved in was going to apply and as well as continuously to get the feedback from the industry. So opportunities like this to share that with the community, uh, that is quite uh, challenging. Uh, so a uh, lot of people, a uh, uh, lot of organizations are focusing on uh, uh, digitization or use of enterprise application across their organization. And most of these people start with uh, like the, the left picture uh, situation of that nature and moving to uh, they, they dream of moving to uh, a digitized arrangement uh, of uh, the second uh, right hand picture. So construction industry is uh, not a different uh, to that. Uh, so last 10 years, uh, we were involved with you know, many big contractors, big organizations, to small organization, all are sharing the sort of same dream. Uh, so, uh, plus, you know, uh, we started the implementation of these digital systems, enterprise systems, uh, together with, uh, then we saw various issues and there were a lot of research work also conducted, uh, but still uh, sometimes, you know, the applications were low. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about and uh, share with you. So everybody uh, talk about uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, so before the pandemic or before the new normal, uh, this was a topic, you know, sort of uh, we discussed. Uh, so uh, looking at the, the, the stages that we, we went through with the industry. Uh, so we call it the mechanized production, uh, starting with steam engines and then uh, move to mass production uh, with uh, Henry Ford and the concepts of that era, uh, assembly lines and various sort of things, which brought a lot of some efficiency. And then uh, we faced with uh, automation and IT and electronics, and that brought the further innovation and further productivity improvement. And uh, now we are in the era of uh, uh, the fourth industrial revolution, connectivity, smart technologies, cloud computing, big data, and networked uh, machines and processors. Uh, so all those sort of aspects. So, so some of the research, uh, ongoing research in the construction industry also we can see. Uh, so we are talking, people are increasingly talk about big data uh, and uh, smart technologies. Uh, even construction industries now talking about be, uh, using robots. Uh, but however, to control all these things, you need uh, enterprise systems or systems. And uh, so it's a challenge that uh, all the industries are facing. Uh, so when we look at the, the construction industry, uh, so this is sort of a dream for probably 2030, or even I don't know whether it's later. So from the current uh, sort of arrangement, we can see the trends that are happening. Uh, maybe. Uh, to some extent, uh, we may be uh, imagining uh, the use of various types of things, everybody to uh, use of, you know, some sort of a technology thing to get information, everybody to get connected, and as well as, you know, capturing information 
uh, as it happens. Uh, so as well as we can imagine, uh, already uh, there are robots, uh, construction industry also start using it, like tiling robots, uh, block laying robots, and probably even uh, crane operation and some other things. Uh, and then the office and everything get connected. Uh, so then as well as the supply chain and other factors, all may be connected all these things uh, with these sort of arrangements. And as well as some offsite construction, uh, so a finished slab or something like that. So need to be uh, obtained at a particular time uh, so that it can be come in a truck or something and then can be placed on the place without any burden. So it's like we talk about all these aspects like lean construction, uh, lean manufacturing and all these things. And uh, we are imagining and uh, we are uh, expecting you know, such uh, enterprise wide applications and make a difference to the construction industry as well. So this is the era that we live. Uh, so a lot of people uh, with these sort of trends, uh, uh, they started uh, uh, implementing enterprise applications. So even the uh, uh, construction industry, we saw big contractors even in Sri Lanka uh, start implementing some of those are very expensive. Uh, enterprise system somewhere way back in 2010-2013, that sort of times. Uh, however, the progress that achieved uh, during that time to almost the pandemic time or the new normal time, uh, we can say it was sort of slow. Uh, so the construction industry, Sri Lanka, as well as worldwide, did not uh, record uh, uh, good success in, the, uh, in these areas. So many of these things, when you look at, uh, uh, people look uh, forward for uh, enterprise applications, particularly the ERP, enterprise resource, type, uh, resource planning applications uh, to impact these areas of construction. So what they uh, tried was, uh, or they expected you know, project management and uh, site operation, asset management, like equipment, tools, et cetera, uh, subcontractors, a lot of contractors use subcontractors, a lot of problem areas, purchasing, inventory control, and uh, uh, petty cash management and human resource. So these areas, uh, the contractors were uh, expecting, you know, to make a big difference. And as well as they turn to various types of uh, enterprise systems to uh, make the systems more efficient. However, when you look at the entire global situation, this is from research, uh, the construction industry did not report much of the progress uh, in uh, uh, digital applications. Uh, so even the digitization of the work, uh, some human resource, some uh, uh, aspects related to spending and the usage and other things. Uh, so you can see it's quite gray and uh, not much of things that they achieve. And as a less, uh, 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 even though they are high in labor utilization, digital uh, uh, utilization was low in many of these areas. And uh, while you can see uh, the other sectors, uh, professional serv uh, services, financial sector, uh, uh, even basic manufacturing, they report that certain successes. Uh, but when it came back to uh, the construction, it's quite uh, low. Uh, so I think to some extent, even the education also struggled, uh, et cetera, uh, to you know, get uh, more of uh, this uh, utilization. Uh, so probably even the education also got the same sort of push that I'm going to present, uh, like the construction industry. Uh, so what happened in the construction industry uh, with respect to uh, various types of application. In Sri Lanka, they start, started with the even very expensive uh, SAP type, SAP implementation, uh, and then uh, leading other man, uh, software systems, Microsoft Dynamics, uh, and then Info, uh, and as well as the locally developed systems as well. Uh, so when you compare with uh, many of the things uh, compared to 
construction other sectors, uh, the construction sector did not report uh, much sort of uh, uh, implement uh, sort of success, even though the implementation was uh, at a reasonable uh, rate. Now the question of why these things happen, uh, it's a, a, a topic of quite uh, attraction to many research researchers. And uh, so they came out with uh, various types of reasons why these things did not succeed. So organizational wise, technological wise, and social wise. So organizational wise, quite often what happened was uh, it's lack of senior management support. And uh, so what happened was uh, many organizations uh, start uh, implementing, uh, but the, the involvement of the senior management was low. And as well as many situations, they face technological complexities. Uh, the need of uh, highly complex things as recommended by uh, the vendors and others. Social wise, uh, staff resistance was a quite a high thing. A lot of staff did not uh, like it. So even I was involved with something like six uh, enterprise applications with uh, contractors. And uh, we saw a very decrease of staff resistance. Uh, and as well as lack of senior staff uh, involvement. Uh, they, they like the organization to be converted to the fourth industrial revolution uh, organization, but their part, active role was quite low. Uh, and as well as uh, organizations wise, a lot of people, you know, lack of flexibility. They just wanted to keep the same procedure. So in the construction industry, sometimes you find uh, they want a material requisition. They want somebody to recommend, maybe some organization, four people to recommend, uh, uh, but then uh, uh, they don't want to change that. But it's a, it's a quite a loss and uh, 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 inefficiency. The whole purpose of you know, trying to implement uh, the ERP type applications or enterprise application was lost. So other reasons also of more or less of similar uh, uh, nature. Uh, there were many, even though these things were identified, people were struggling with how to address and how to uh, uh, make, a, make a difference. A uh, lot of organizations were failed to redesign the business processes. For example, in the banking sector, they were able to do the redesign and many other sectors, insurance sector, but many uh, construction and even to some degree, even manufacturing, uh, that was the problem case. Lack of hardware and software, uh, technological wise. Uh, so balancing project team, uh, a lot of people did not understand the, the uh, change required. So there were many, many aspects that were connected to of that phase. So the list goes on and as you go down, you can see uh, less and less uh, influential uh, factors were identified. Uh, so, uh, uh, so finally, uh, the net result was, even though all these things were identified, uh, there was not much of uh, applications or much uh, utilization as the organizations wants. So there are uh, reasons are of uh, uh, many. Uh, so even, uh, you know, uh, fitting uh, the ERP system to the organization structure. Uh, as I told you, you know, uh, when we got involved with uh, the implementation, you know, sometimes when they have three people recommending, they want to keep three people recommending. Uh, the, even though it's not necessary, it's uh, a daily tax. Uh, sometimes they want somebody to authorize, somebody to uh, then only uh, do the thing. But however, you find in the organization, everything is decided by the managing director. Typical, you know, constructor type, uh, contractor type organizations in Sri Lanka, because most of those things are uh, owner driven organizations or family owned businesses. And quite often, you know, uh, even purchasing decisions are kept with the managing director at the end of the day. Uh, so it was, you know, is issues are quite a large uh, in, in that way. So many people were struggling and uh, even tailoring, uh, customizing, uh, identifying many factors of that nature. So what happened? Uh, then uh, when you look at the, all these uh, processes wise, uh, the 
processes that we discussed, the uh, inventory, site operation, and they, there are many other uh, aspects. And as well as uh, sometimes looking at the best practices, guidelines, like project management, body of knowledge, uh, there were a lot of gaps that were you know, faced in many of these implementations. So we did the research, you know, try to identify the uh, doing research, you know, what happened in these areas, uh, as well as, you know, try to identify what exactly uh, can be done and uh, various things. So we uh, did a couple of research uh, in this area, some are for postgraduate MSCs and in fields, some are undergraduate research, and uh, from one to the other, we looked at many sort of areas. So we looked at uh, project management area, financial management area, and then inventory management area. And then we found out, you know, the various uh, aspects that are there uh, with respect to these things. Uh, uh, so a lot of situations, uh, the, the, the practice and the, the softwares and enterprise systems, the mismatch was a sort of a, a big issue. And uh, sometimes, you know, because of that, they were not able to uh, go forward and uh, various types of things. So in various types of areas, uh, uh, taking, you know, uh, project uh, management, cost variance analysis. Uh, so a lot of people even did not understand the importance of it. Uh, so critical things, even though many systems can provide such good information, uh, but there was a huge gap uh, of the, the real people who are managing and understanding uh, of those things. Even payments and uh, reconciliations uh, aspects. And then, uh, uh, so even uh, simple aspects of uh, material requisition, GRAs. Uh, so some of them, uh, uh, understood only uh, these sort of aspects uh, only when they saw it in enterprise systems and concepts of such things like uh, reorder levels uh, and things a lot of people did not understand fully. Uh, so those are the sort of problem areas. So site operations uh, and other things also similar even though the systems and organizations were ready for that thing. So when you move on to various other operations, uh, uh, the lot of uh, other problems came out uh, with, for example, the way that these managed subcontractors, many of the systems could not provide the facilities required. And even uh, their payments management, because of the complex uh, arrangements that are there uh, as well. And then uh, uh, construction industry particularly, they manage large amount of cash uh, as called petty cash. And uh, so sometimes there are purchases, sometimes uh, payments done to subcontractors, workers, and through these arrangements. And a lot of uh, these things can be uh, automated and uh, uh, helped by these enterprise systems, but their understanding of how to do these things were low. So even the other ones, even HRM facilities, uh, purchasing aspects, uh, the approval processes, uh, etc., cetera, was sort of very uh, problematic areas. So sometimes even uh, we expect that even simple processes like quotations and other things to happen, but sometimes uh, these things did not happen. And uh, many organizations were using all different things. And when the procedures were set in an enterprise application to follow, uh, they couldn't you know, handle it. So it was uh, various ways, uh, some were low and uh, some were not applicable. And finally, we looked at uh, uh, so those sort of impacts and uh, uh, the usage was uh, quite a lot of people were uh, trying to use or using inventory systems. Uh, sometimes some HRM aspects were there, uh, but when it comes to estimating and other things, uh, the low aspects were recorded. So, so there was a gap in these sort of things as well. So there were different systems uh, used in the recent past. Uh, the, however, what we noticed is uh, no significant effect on ERP type on these gaps. So it's not the, the technology or the enterprise system, but the way that the people handle it. So when we looked at the manufacturing companies and construction companies, uh, 
there are differences as well, and they were uh, uh, hand handling, uh, they were facing those aspects uh, in a way. way. Uh, one of the problems is uh, there are projects, and while in the manufacturing sector, uh, it's in sort of a office or a factory or something of that nature. Uh, further, in the manufacturing companies, the product cycle or the root works are more of routine nature, while in constructions, it's, uh, there were so many other uniqueness or uncertainties brought into these projects. And when it was handed over in isolated geographical locations, that too, it was uh, uh, problematic and uh, construction projects, uh, the unpredictable aspects that are happening. Uh, further, there was issues with respect to technical competences. Uh, so how do you want to get the, the connections, uh, how to handle our systems, assist people to uh, utilize these uh, enterprise systems, etc., were quite a problematic and other challenges. So there were so certain recommendations we uh, came out with uh, in those research uh, in various ways. Uh, uh, even though these things were uh, discussed and uh, shared with uh, uh, many implementations, uh, it didn't help much uh, to overcome the situation. Uh, so as well as, you know, sometimes, you know, they agree, okay, well, let's do this way, but then the ad hoc behavior and various kinds of other things happen. Uh, so a lot of things get uh, broken down again. So same thing uh, in the other areas as well. Uh, then uh, sometimes, you know, various reasons that were not stated, uh, sometimes malpractices, sometimes other things, uh, various sort of things, uh, you know, uh, made the various barriers and gaps uh, for these things. Uh, so a lot of uh, even tendering, estimating areas, uh, people are very much not so used to even the planning, budgeting, those uh, basic cost, basic concepts were not uh, sometimes understood. Uh, and uh, many basic uh, aspects that are required, like we call it in manufacturing sector, like bombs, uh, we call it in the construction sector called rate analysis. And sometimes, you know, in the, the organization, they, they don't practice or don't have these things. So when you go into various, uh, the, the critical areas, things tend to you know, run into various types of difficulties. Uh, Subcontractor management also is a sort of a very challenging area. Uh, you know, various types of uh, you know, ad hoc or non-standardized arrangements. Uh, petty cash was big other issue. Uh, pe people love uh, in construction uh, at site level petty cash. Uh, so it's like, you know, buying things on your way home, back home. Uh, but it caused various issues and as well as uh, management to the project and to implement and to move forward to organization with enterprise systems. And these were uh, huge barriers and issues. So similarly, uh, asset management, for example, in the case of construction industry, uh, one of the big impacts can come from these areas. But not of understanding and not of keeping any records, uh, valuations, uh, systematic ways of doing it, even transferring, uh, recording its usage, and all those things were sort of uh, faced as challenges. Human resource management also of the same, uh, even management of even leave at site and other conditions uh, were, were very difficult. But in the case of enterprise applications, these things were provided. And those things were provided even with use of mobile phones and various arrangements, uh, but you know, faced with various difficulties. Similarly, the other areas, project management and other things also, uh, similar uh, issues were faced and uh, had difficulties. Okay, so what I want to share uh, with this one, so what happened was in many organizations, particularly uh, we did this research and work uh, with this, uh, something like we closely worked with uh, those who implemented their enterprise systems, uh, roughly about uh, seven to eight uh, contract organizations. Uh, so, and uh, to some extent, uh, 
So all these things were struggles, difficulties faced by uh, the, these companies, particularly during the period of 2013 to 2019. Uh, so even uh, implementing simple procedures like material request and inventory control uh, was not so easy in, in that era uh, that might be faced here in these aspects. Uh, uh, so, so basically at the end of the things, uh, so many uh, did not report satisfactory progress uh, for the time that they spent. Uh, so some organization could not move, uh, even though some, are, some of them are paid, uh, invested in the order of 300 million, uh, sometimes they could not move from account systems to uh, inventory control system. So they couldn't, you know, uh, address the areas like asset management or uh, many wider site operations, uh, various aspects of that nature, which basically without those things, we can't imagine them going into the fourth industrial revolution. If they can't uh, uh, address these issues now uh, and uh, getting into the to systems, inter enterprise wide system, uh, it will be almost difficult or impossible uh, when we talk about the next uh, level uh, using uh, robots, uh, automatic uh, instruments like uh, incorporating into the site, and as well as uh, using uh, tabs and mobile phones for communication, uh, various types of things. However, uh, many people were forced uh, during this new normal time or the COVID time uh, to do it through the digital means. Uh, so what happened was uh, particularly about uh, three organizations and particularly two organizations, uh, they, they uh, understood, uh, okay, the facilities are available and uh, it's a matter of pushing and getting these things done. And uh, so they were able to get a, quite a lot of progress uh, during this new normal time. So in a way, it was a silver line or the maybe even much bigger than the silver line to these organizations helping them uh, that their new normal arrangement uh, you know uh, to push them to uh, move into these sort of operational levels uh, so as well as uh, it helped uh, uh, the new aspects you know new way of communicating and the way that the technology works and as uh, uh, particularly you know when they are separated and still need to meet the organizational needs and challenges. And when they realize uh, this is actually can be done through enterprise systems, uh, that helped them to understand and use it fully. So two organizations made the quite a progress uh, to go into almost fully digital uh, integrated enterprise application status. Uh, so that is, you know, all aspects. Uh, that we discuss in these operations. So to some extent, uh, even when I uh, reflect back uh, the era of about six years, uh, things that we tried to achieve, uh, some of those things, you know, uh, it was uh, able to achieve within this uh, short period. Even with uh, the environment of uh, not so good for uh, the working arrangements. So to some extent, a uh, lot of organizations uh, realize uh, these uh, particular contractors, the, the uh, uh, new arrangements and help them to uh, move into a difficult things. So I am optimistic about, you know, the other organizations as well as the new uh, sharing of the new, uh, the, this knowledge, this experience. Uh, it will bring a new set of research and as well as new way of uh, learning and it will be uh, helpful, a new way of achieving enterprise applications uh, in the organizations, particularly in the construction organization. Okay, that's what I want to share and thank you very much. And uh, uh, hope uh, if you have any questions to answer those uh, during my, our discussion time. Thank you very much. Uh, over to the chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Pereira. Uh, indeed, it was a uh, really, very really good lecture and uh, 
and I'm, I'm happy that in this session um, we covered from uh, water problem. Then we, we talked about the collaboration the institute for um, um, developing the socioeconomic, uh, and then you have taken a very good uh, aspect of uh, construction. That is, uh, in fact, that is the most uh, uh, affected area um, in the uh, uh, this uh, COVID period. And uh, so now uh, we move to the uh, another aspect of the real life, that very important aspect, that is the uh, medical aspect. So, so next uh, talk is uh, in that area only, that is by Professor um, R. Gopura. He will be talking about the robotics, uh, prosthetic limbs, and advanced medical technology. Uh, so, uh, So, Professor Ruan Gopura is currently the head of Department of Medical Technology, Faculty of Medicine, and Director of Research uh, at Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Moratuwa. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ruan Gopura received the BSc Engineering uh, Honors Degree and um, Master's Engineering Degree from University of Moratuwa and PhD in Robotics and Intelligence System from Sage University, Japan in 2009. Uh, he is a professor attached to the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Moratova, and uh, from <coughs> Professor Gopura has won many awards to his credit locally and internationally. He has obtained several patents and published more than 110 research articles. Professor Gopura is a senior member of uh, ITPALI, IEEE Robotics and Automation Society, IEEE Engineering, Medicine and Biology Society. He is the immediate past chair of IEEE Sri Lanka section and IEEE Robotics and Automation Society Sri Lanka section chapter. Currently, he is the director of um, um, research at University of Morotova and head of the Department of Medical Technology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Morotova. His research interests include robotics, and uh, biomechatronics. So now I request to Professor Ivan Gopura uh, to have the discussion on a very important topic where this robotics is going to help in the medic medical technology. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Arya. I hope that uh, I'm audible enough and yes, you can yes. see my screen. Yeah, your voice is very clear and we can see your screen. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, Good evening uh, and uh, good afternoon and uh, good morning, those who are in the different timeline of this uh, virtual uh, presentation. So um, today's uh, my topic is robotic prosthetic limbs as an advanced medical technology. Before we go into the details, first I would like to thank uh, the organizing committee of uh, Kotalaura Defense University International Research Conference 2021 and also the um, uh, the Dean of the Engineering Faculty. So my topic is uh, basically related to the medical aspects and uh, robotics. So uh, the theme of uh, today's uh, plenary talk is security, sustainability and uh, national development in the new normal. I would like to uh, connect my topic into the uh, theme, especially related to national development, how we can uh, use the physically weak or disabled person to the uh, national development. So in the presentation, I have 25 slides. I'll uh, take uh, 30 minutes and I have a few videos. So first of all, I will discuss about uh, medical technology and uh, the usages and what are the current priorities in medical technology. And then I'll move on to one of the medical technologies, the bionic devices. And under the bionic devices, we can discuss about robotic prosthetic limbs. I, I'll mainly focus about robotic prosthetic limbs. And then at the end of the presentation, I'll briefly 
describe about some of the research that we are carrying out at the Bionics Laboratory at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, University of Moratua. So I have three cases in here. Now, as all of you know, the COVID-19 pandemic situation has created a mess in the world. The world is facing a lot of issues and uh, we have to find some solution for this COVID-19 pandemic situation. There are solutions, vaccine technology and many other technologies to spread, uh, uh, to prevent the spreading of this COVID-19 pandemic situation. In addition to that, in the world, there are underprivileged, sometimes people are there, like physically weak people and amputated uh, body parts available in some people. So because of several reasons like uh, traumas, injuries, as well as accidents, also as uh, casualties of wars, there are people with disability as well as amputated body parts. So these people also need some support even in the new normal. Apart from that, uh, in the different part of the world, different diseases are spreading. Now, if you can take it into the Sri Lankan context, uh, north central province of Sri Lanka, we can see unknown kind of uh, kidney diseases. For these issues in the world, we need some solution. So one of the solution is medical technology. For the, the first case I have discussed is COVID-19 situation. There, we need some technology to prevent uh, the spreading as well as to find some cures. Vaccine technologies are developing as well as different medical devices are developing like um, um, different medical devices like monitors and uh, ventilators to cater this uh, pandemic situation. In addition to that, second case I have explained is the physically weak and disabled people. So they need also support from medical technology for that different devices, assistive devices, bionic devices have been developed robotic processes as well as robotic orthotic devices. In addition to that, in the Sri Lankan context, what I have mentioned there was the uh, kidney disease. For that, we are using the technological support for the dialysis, hemodialysis, as well as perinolial dialysis, and also transplantation. We need uh, support from the medical technology. So medical technology can be defined in the different ways. In the medical technology, what we need is prevention, diagnosis, monitoring, and support for the treatment and also for the care. So in the, the background uh, video, you can see one of the medical technology, Da Vinci surgical robot, with, which assists uh, for the surgeons, for the training of the surgery, as well as for the uh, carry out the surgery. So the medical technology, has uh, several definitions. Uh, in Science Direct, uh, in, in one of their articles, they have uh, defined medical technology as an application of science to develop solutions for the healthcare issues, problems, such as uh, prevention or delay of diseases. So these technologies are important, not in the, uh, the current situation, but in the new normal as well. So uh, these technologies develop product, services, and solution to save and improve the life of people, and also improve the quality of the life of people. You can see one of the uh, medical technology output, 3D printed knee here. And these uh, technology, medical technology, are practical, are developing practical application using scientific knowledge. There we use technical knowledge and tools. So here I have uh, uh, given a video that we created for IESL, uh, uh, journal, IESL uh, newsletter and we have published it in IESL. So this video briefly give about the uh, oral understanding of medical technology. First, we will watch the video and then we will continue our discussion. Professor Ara, can you hear the, uh, the sound of the video? 
Just a minute. Can you hear the sound? Not, not yet. Yeah, just a minute. I'll, I'll share again. Now it is audible. Right, okay. Many factors that affect the human quality of life can be addressed by medical technologies. It is termed as the use of technological knowledge, tools and systems to protect the organisms from disease, harm or death. Such technology facilitates prevention, diagnosis, treatment, monitoring and care. The solutions provided by medical technology can be simple solutions, mid-level solutions and high-tech solutions. Uh, medical technology, we have simple solutions, mid-level solution, and uh, high-tech solutions. So we discuss uh, about the prosthetic limbs and bionic devices, especially robotic prosthetic limbs. Those are uh, high-tech solutions. So um, if you consider about the te medical technologies, uh, the current uh, priorities, of course, as you all all know the current priority number one should go to the technological solution for COVID-19 situation, especially uh, the vaccine technology and related technologies. And then uh, the telehealth, again, because of uh, the uh, COVID-19 situation. So we have uh, started new research related to telehealth as well as uh, virtual care. And uh, in addition to that wearable technology, which uh, uh, support the human being to wear different technologies to measure their uh, pulse rate and heart rate and blood pressure, different things will come under this uh, wearable technology. And also VR, AR technology, virtual reality, augmented reality technologies are also under uh, the, the first set of uh, priority in medical technology. In addition to that, medical robotic systems, as well as uh, binoc devices are available in the priority list, but binoc devices are in the least priority. But we know that uh, like underprivileged people who has lost their limbs as well as who are physically weak need some support even in the new normals. Therefore, these binoc devices, especially prosthetic and orthotic limb related research and development should uh, carry forward and we should give priority for those technologies as well. So first of all, uh, we, I, I'll discuss about uh, some of these bionic uh, devices. So these devices are important, especially uh, because we have higher elderly population and amputees around the globe. So as you can see from 2005 to two, uh, 2015, the number of upper limb amputees will be doubled this is in, in uh, the USA situation. So because of uh, these amputees and uh, elderly population, most of them are physically weak, uh, healthcare sector faces 
major challenges in providing support for them. So in this situation creates uh, some socioeconomic uh, problem for the social economic growth as well. So therefore in this situation, as, um, as researchers, we can develop different kind of devices using bio Bionics technology to support these individuals. Therefore, Bionic technology can play a vital role. So if you take uh, Bionic devices, we can categorize in different ways. For the purpose of this presentation, I have categorized them into uh, three processes and authors and other devices. So we, we will mainly focus on processes processes we can categorize again in different cat categories. Now this category is based on the application of the prosthesis, upper limb, prosthetic, lower limb and other types. So what is a bionic device? Bionic device is a device which uh, help the physically weak people by replacing, uh, by uh, replacing his uh, available uh, weak limb for, for the weak limb, they, they provide uh, uh, another supportive device or give an enhancement for the uh, available weak limb. So uh, in the bionics, we mainly focus on robotic processes and exoskeleton robot. There are other devices as well. But in this situation, uh, we mainly focus on robotic processes. What is a prosthetic device? It is an artificial replacement of missing body part. Your body part is uh, normal. For that, uh, you, can, you, can have, you can have artificial uh, device. You can see in this person, the uh, arm is amputated from above the, above the elbow, that kind of amputation we call transhumeral amputation. For the person, for that person, if you can have wearable device, this kind of a device, you can see it appearance, his appearance can be improved as well as if the device can, is a functional device, he can use the device for day-to-day -day activities. So prosthetic limb or prosthetic device is a replacement of missing uh, body part. So these uh, prosthetic devices can be categorized in uh, different categories based on the level of amputation and based on the location of, location of applications. You can see now we can have a different level of amputation. If your arm is amputated below the elbow, such kind of amputation we call uh, transradial. If it is above the elbow, we, can, we will say the amputation is transhumeral. Based on the level of amputation, uh, we can name the prosthetic as well. If the prosthetic is used for below elbow amputees, we call the prosthetic as transradial prosthetic device. And also based on the type, uh, based on the type of uh, actuation, we can uh, categorize this device. Cosmetic prosthetic device, body powered as well as externally powered. Externally powered prosthetic device we name as robotic prosthetic device. The, our main focus today is about the robotic prosthetic device. So um, cosmetic processes, just, uh, just to give the appearance, you can, the amputee can wear it. Uh, but body powered, uh, you can see is a body powered prosthetic device. So the, this person, uh, so his um, uh, forearm is amputated from the below the below the uh, elbow. So that kind of amputation we call trans uh, radial amputation. So he can wear uh, this kind of a prosthetic device. The device actuation can happen using the available body part. In this situation, available body part is a shoulder. Using shoulder, he can actuate the device. For the actuation, there is a mechanism which consists a cable and harness device. When he carry out the shoulder motion, the cable extends from that, he can get an opening of the hook, which can create uh, a chance to grip this cup. Likewise, 
uh, you can see the uh, the the operation of this kind of uh, body part prosthetic device in this video. So he can wear the device and carry out the shoulder motion from that, the hook opening and closing can be carried out. So in addition to that, uh, the our interest today is about robotic prosthetic uh, devices, robotic prosthetic limbs. Robotic prosthetic limbs act as a cosmetic device as well as uh, those device, those devices can be used for assisting daily activities of the uh, amputee. So it has function as well as appearance. So there are a lot of uh, prosthetic devices uh, have been uh, developed. You can see a few of them. Uh, now this DAP arm uh, is a full upper limb prosthetic device. It's a modular one. Uh, if you want uh, a wrist module, you can take that. If you want uh, the elbow, come elbow, you can take like that. Likewise, uh, this is a modular device. And in addition to that, Autobock, Boston and Uta, they have, they have developed different type, type of prosthetic device. And uh, the uh, B-Bionic arm, you can see here, it, it is a, a device which is available in the, in the market. This key grip, this allows you to hold credit cards, bank cards, car keys, etc., etc. And now move to a point, pretty self-explanatory. This one will allow me to type on the keyboards. We then move the thumb to this position and we can get a tripod grip. So picking put small things up. We can then change the grip. So you could see in uh, that design, uh, even to carry out some motion, you have to manually uh, shift the thumb. Uh, thumb. So if you can develop a device which can automatically uh, move the thumb to have different grasping patterns, it will be an, uh, a new design. In addition to those, there are uh, different uh, designs and prototypes are available. Some are in the market, uh, Lucam and uh, Atom Touch Harm. Those are the state of the art devices. If you take Lucam, it has 10 powered joints and six uh, gripping patterns can be generated. And it, it uh, has a, a control method which uh, can use different control inputs like electromagnetic signals, uh, IMU signal and different uh, switches signal. And Atom Arm has uh, uh, 26 degrees of freedom. Uh, it's capable of performing a finger motion, but uh, the finger abduction adduction uh, is uh, not available in that arm. Right, so these uh, prosthetic uh, devices, uh, the important thing is we can develop different uh, designs, but controlling of these things, uh, prosthetic limbs are very difficult because uh, these uh, devices should control according to the motion intention of the person, human motion intention. Now, if you take uh, this uh, ima image, now motion intention usually uh, creates in the brain and uh, the intention will go to the different uh, muscle at the arm through the nerve system. The, the muscle electric signal then convert to the mechanical signal, then uh, the motion is happening. If your arm is amputated, uh, even that case also muscle signals are available. If the muscle is available, those signals we can use uh, for the purpose of controlling these uh, devices. So these um, devices usually control using biosignal like uh, EMG, electromyography, those are muscle signal, muscle activity levels. In addition to that, electroencephalography signals can be used. In addition to that, uh, some physical sensors are also used for the, uh, the controlling of this system because sometimes uh, uh, electromy if you use the electromyography signal, sometimes uh, if the controller did not detect the electromyography signal, so then uh, control will be disturbed. In such kind of situation, uh, physical sensors can be used so that uh, the system will, will work uh, properly without a disturbance. 
So uh, these uh, prosthetic device, uh, there are challenges for the development, especially these devices should be wearable devi devices. So the device will, uh, will be attached to the human. So these are uh, man machine devi devices. And therefore, uh, of course, uh, the complex complexities of the human anatomy and also anthropometry, uh, anthropometry uh, will uh, come in into the uh, into the account when we do the design. So, the complex complexities create a challenge for development of this device, especially uh, when we want to restore the natural motion. Uh, we have to think about different designs and control inputs. As I mentioned earlier, we use uh, bio biosignals. But uh, detecting, amplifying, and identifying the motion uh, intention using the biosignal is not uh, very easy. And in addition to that, uh, required accessory like motors, sensors, mechanisms, and uh, batteries uh, are important to develop this device. So to develop uh, lightweight, uh, less bulky, accessories are also a challenging in the research of this uh, uh, prosthetic limbs. So uh, recently uh, we have developed several prototypes of uh, the prosthetic uh, arms. So I, I'll uh, show you a few of uh, those. This is a mobile uh, trans humeral prosthetic limb and we use uh, electromicrophy signal to control the device. We use only one uh, channel, EMG channel, to control the device. So the second video is about uh, a finger mechanism. So we have uh, used a uh, 3D printer, 3D printed uh, material as used for the device. If this is you and then we should all burn together Watch the flames climb higher Into the night Calling out Father Oh, stand by and we will Watch the flames burn over and over Parents, we will Watch the flames burn over and over The mountainside Desolation comes upon. Right. So the specialty of the previous one is uh, the uh, its mechanism. So based on the uh, the mechanism, we can uh, get the uh, grasping of different uh, size object. You could see that uh, even a pen and the lid of a, uh, the bottle can be grasped using the uh, the mechanism. So this is uh, one other device. Uh, prosthetic uh, hand, the specialty there is it can generate uh, abduction-adduction motion. 
So abduct, abduction, adduction motion of the fingers can rarely be found in the uh, devices in the literature. It can generate uh, all the finger motion as well uh, the abduction and adduct, adduction of all the fingers. So we we'll, uh, see the some of the combined motion of fingers. So it can generate different grasping patterns. This is a uh, power grasping. So these are some of the work that we have carried out uh, two, three years back. Right. So then let's go to the, uh, the recent uh, work. So I grasp a prosthetic hand. Uh, you can see the uh, CAD model of the hand, which consists of a hand unit, wrist unit, and clutching unit. The speciality or the novelty of this work, it can uh, generate palm arching. You can see the palm arching uh, there. In addition to that, it can generate thumb motion, thumb uh, opposition and opposition. And uh, we have, uh, develop the cover or casing of the device using flexible uh, material, Ninja Flex. And the device can uh, mimic the uh, biological hand. Therefore, this uh, device we call uh, biomimetic uh, device. So this uh, device consists of uh, the hand, clutch unit, and uh, finger units. It can generate thumb uh, opposition, reposition motion. Tendon driven mechanism is used for the uh, actuation. And the clutching system we have specially designed to uh, carry out the motion of the device. And uh, we carried out experiment with this uh, device and we found that uh, it can generate uh, 12 grasping patterns. So therefore it can, uh, uh, carry out uh, more than 70% of the tasks found in the activities of daily living. And also we analyze, analyze the uh, finger motions and we found that uh, consecutive motion of the phalanges can be uh, carried out using the uh, device. And uh, this is a video we have created uh, for this uh, device. a robotic prosthetic hand developed for people with transradial amputations, which means amputations below the elbow. This prosthetic hand is developed with features such as passive isometric hold, palm arching, and thumb opposition, while maintaining a close resemblance to the human skin using flexible surface materials. I grasp consists of three units, hand unit, wrist unit, and clutching unit. The underactuated prosthetic fingers in eye grasp can achieve adaptive grasping through tendon mechanisms. The passive isometric hold is maintained using a clutch system with one-way bearings. This prosthetic hand can achieve 12 grasping patterns. It can support in performing more than 70% of day-to-day -day activities. 
Let's look at some of these grasping actions. With that uh, video, I have come to the conclusion of uh, this uh, presentation. So uh, in this presentation, uh, we have discussed about uh, the medical technology. Medical technology uh, usually occurs prevention, diagnosis, uh, diagnosis, monitoring, treatment and care for the improvement of the quality of life of the people. And also they uh, support us to save the life of the people as well. And one of the medical technologies are the uh, bionic tech devices. So these uh, devices act as replacement or enhancement of organs or other body part by mechanical uh, versions. And uh, as one of the bionic uh, devices, we discuss about robotic uh, prosthetic limbs. So there are a lot of uh, devices, robotic prosthetic limbs have been developed. So we are also carrying out some research in this area. But uh, in this area, I think uh, the future work will go on the, the improvement of dexterity, of dexterity of the prosthetic limbs. What I mean uh, by dexterity here is the carrying out uh, skillful motion like uh, human uh, device, human uh, hands. And the controlling of this device should be improved, especially uh, we are using bionic signals to control this device, but there are avenues to develop these uh, control systems. So uh, that's all. Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank all the, uh, the audience of the presentation as well as my teams at the Bionics Laboratory, University of Morocco. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, Dr. Rohan Gopura. Uh, and it was a, really a very interesting lecture and uh, have opened a lot of um, uh, research avenues for the uh, researchers. Now, this is the time for uh, having the questions. So we have got the couple of questions uh, through chat box. So we will take them one by one. And uh, the, there are many uh, uh, questions for uh, Professor Siva Kumar. Professor Siva Kumar is there? Yes, yes, I'm okay, here. Fine. Uh, uh, this was the question from Professor uh, Asok Pereira. Yeah. Uh, he is asking that uh, can uh, this Bolo Goda or the uh, Bera can be used for the coastal reservoir to supply drinking water to the Colombo districts. Right, okay. Well, first of all, uh, you know, I, I have uh, just uh, now at, uh, looked at all the five questions. Uh, yeah. Do you want me to answer one by one or you, you would like or, or, to? Or, okay, let me let me read all the questions and then you can answer uh, uh, some right. Yeah, okay, right. Okay. Uh, there was the, another question was from uh, this uh, uh, Dr. Gunasekara. How economical yeah. is coastal reservoir in reaching a desirable water quality? And the next question is from Dr. Uh, Nilukul Gunasekra. Uh, what could be uh, effective uh, effect of the uh, river slope uh, on uh, the maintenance? And then this is the question from Kumari Fernando. When the demand sites are in an upper elevation, water needs to be pumped. And uh, so any practice from constructed uh, uh, coastal reservoir and there is one uh, question from Mr. Sunil. In Sri Lanka, sandbar formation across river mouths results in increased flood levels in low-lying coastal areas. Could the construction of CRs further aggravate this situation and adversely affect an even larger population? And uh, this is the, uh, the question from uh, Dr. Nadika Migun Tenna. What are your suggestions on going for the physical modeling together with numerical modeling with respect to the uh, coastal reservoir modeling. So these are the questions. So okay, thank uh, you, Professor. Yeah, look, uh, I, I have just uh, now uh, digested those five questions and I would first of all like to thank all the five people for raising that. They are very important uh, questions that have been raised uh, 
uh, even uh, even if you are looking at this for the first time, I can really see that how much uh, you have sort of looked into that properly. So, okay. So let me I start with the first one. I've already made some brief uh, comments on the chat, uh, but then I decided to wait till all the questions. Maybe there are some similarities. So, so with reference to Bolo, uh, Bologoda and Beira lakes, I think these are in, in Colombo and um, particularly when you have urban lakes, not whether it's Colombo, whether it's in Bangalore or in any other very intense cities, uh, one has to be much more careful about what sort of uh, industrial and other organic contaminant, uh, you know, uh, organic and inorganic contaminants which have already been discharged in the historically. And so we need to really do a very good assessment of water and sediment contaminants. Of course, currently we do have technologies to uh, even take that water and uh, treat with, uh, you know, drinking water standards, but, but at a cost, I guess. So it's really, it's not because of there is no, technology available. Um, some of the technologies we are working on is membrane uh, distillation, which practically any, any quality water you can take and make it to a drinking water standard, but at what cost and what sort of energy requirements comes into the picture. So, so it is possible, but we, but we need to do a good assessment. The second question is from uh, uh, Nilupil Gunasekara. Actually, it's a very good one. Actually, it's about um, uh, river mouth, uh, uh, how economical is coastal reservoirs? Uh, actually, we did look at uh, some coasting, although it was not a very detailed study, but in terms of existing coastal reservoirs and uh, and potential future coastal reservoirs, they're very comparable to inland reservoirs, uh, but it could be even slightly cheaper because the construction involved in, uh, you know, for example, in the inland reservoirs, you, you need very high quality, you know, uh, Usually, uh, reinforced concrete dams. If the if the uh, the height of the uh, um, uh, water level is very high, whereas in the in the uh, coastal reservoir, the one side is salt water, another side is clean water. So so there is already that uh, uh, hydrostatic balance is there. Then so you can really use some some innovative uh, cheaper technologies. I do agree that there is a, a, a you know a site specific aspect of river slope uh, and their velocities and and the maintenance aspect of uh, sediment should be looked into, but you can always look at some pre-sedimentation type of uh, uh, sort of systems. For example, in the Shinkausa Reservoir in Shanghai, uh, you know, it's uh, Yangtze River carries quite a significant amount of sediments, although they have multiple dams upstream. Uh, so uh, because of sediment, uh, there is a distribution of, uh, you know, the, the uh, sediment, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, concentration, there is a distribution. And normally in coastal reservoirs, you pick up the, the cleaner part on the top part of that uh, water, I guess. So, so that's what they do it in uh, Shinkausa. Uh, the third question is about uh, uh, um, when the demand sites are in upper elevation, yes. Look, uh, coastal reservoirs, clearly it's on the, at, at the main sea level and uh, any, any application uh, it's going to be involved some pumping. Uh, and uh, what is important is that when you are making a new infrastructure, we should make sure that uh, it does have a uh, zero carbon footprint. Uh, for example, in, in Sydney, when we made the uh, treatment plant for de seawater desalination, it currently operates on zero carbon footprint. There are other places where they do buy the renewable certificate and then, uh, uh, you know, so they balance the amount of energy utilized with other renewable sources, or you can actually use uh, solar or wind or, or, or tidal type of uh, power system. So it's important that uh, the water that's going to be pumped from coastal reservoir should be carbon neutral. So we need to really look for other, uh, other technologies to, to get that. Sonil, the uh, is an interesting presentation. Oh yeah, okay, sandbar. Yes, I think this is uh, an, an in, uh, important one. Again, it would be very site specific. You know, formation of sandbars are very complex. It involves uh, uh, the river flows, the the, the tidal uh, hydrodynamics, uh, the you know longshore, foreshore currents, and uh, even sediment transport along the coast. So. Um, I do feel that by constructing coastal reservoir, we probably can avoid this, but but it needs to be studied properly. So you probably need some channel modification required at the mouth, uh, so that uh, uh, so these uh, aspects of what is the impact of coastal reservoir on the surrounding sediment transport, particularly beaches, etc., need to be looked at. And finally, uh, Dr. Nadika's comment: a very good question is about. 
how uh, important is physical modeling? You know, uh, yes, we do know that uh, um, that, that versus numerical modeling. Uh, you know, we know it's impossible to construct all the, uh, the coastal reservoirs into physical modeling. And of course there are size uh, and size scale uh, limitations comes in. But uh, I do feel that there is a, a role for um, uh, physical modeling, particularly once the uh, coastal reservoirs, uh, you know, you have looked at many different options and you are more or less deciding on one option. I think it would be nice to check with some physical models how well that's working. Uh, I think in the uh, Shanghai experience, I do understand that uh, not only modeling, but they have done monitoring, uh, water quality monitoring over a period of seven to eight years on looking at how salinity is varying in the mouth. Uh, uh, and they did both uh, numerical and uh, physical modeling as well. So there, there are experience from Shanghai that they have done all of this. So I hope uh, my quick uh, summary has sort of captured those five uh, questions. I'm happy to elaborate if you all want something further. Uh, I think you, that uh, um, the people who have asked the question, they are uh, satisfied with the uh, comment by Professor Shiva Kumar. And even if they still have some uh, uh, queries or some clarification they might, uh, I think they can uh, uh, write to him through email and can, they can- Absolutely, the thank you. I'll be delighted yeah. to have the conversation, yeah. thank you. Now we have uh, uh, two quick questions uh, from uh, Professor Cecil. Uh, one is uh, for uh, frequency control in DESS, better responsive than the rotational mass through generators. And other question is, what are the benefits that an EV owner could get if discharging, they would discharge their battery uh, to the grid, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, where the second hand market for vehicles are high too. Yes, um, thank you very much for these uh, questions. The first questions, um, Frequency control, battery energy storage systems, better responsive than rotational, rotational masses through generators. Actually, um, um, the, the thing is now because of zero marginal cost of uh, renewable generation. Um, so in the economic dispatch, you would like to replace the uh, synchronous generation based generation or power plants with renewable renewable sources in the economic dispatch and when we are talking about if you listen to this morning uh, uh, mr we had uh, the principal um, advisor to the president uh, he also mentioned this the government's commit, commit, commitment to go for 70% renewable integration, renewable energy in the national grid. So what happens is here, what they mean by renewables is uh, solar PV systems and uh, wind power plants. So they are inverter based. You know that in solar, you produce DC and then you produce, uh, you convert to regu regulated DC and then DC to AC. So it's an inverter based. So there is no rotating um, inertia. And when it comes to wind, um, wind generator produces variable frequency AC output that AC is converted to DC and then again DC to regulated AC, the, the right voltage, right frequency. So uh, what happens is, when this renewable share in the grid increases, the rotational inertia decreases. As a result, what you call contingency situation, if a large power plant trips, the system frequency is going to drop very, very fast, rate of change of frequency. You know that when the system frequency drops to 50 Hertz is the nominal frequency, it drops to 45 the one by one, the generator is going to trip, leading to a blackout, total system collapse. You know, how costly that is. That is going to be very costly to a, to a country. Um, now, that's the reason why in renewables heavy, 
national grid, you will require distributed battery storage systems to come to the rescue of the system stability, um, system stability in case of um, emergency situation. Those are low probability, you know, high risk situations. Now, um, that is the thing. The, the starting point is renewables heavy grid. In the grid, you have a lot of renewable sources or inverter-based sources, very little uh, synchronous, synchronous generator-based uh, energy generation. In that situation, you will require distributed battery storage systems to come to the rescue, uh, depending on the requirement of the system requirement. Question number two. Yes, um, uh, the question is, uh, what are the benefits that an EV owner could get if discharging, they would discharge their battery to the grid, especially in a country like Sri Lanka, where second hand market for vehicles are high too. Yeah, uh, there is another one uh, about the battery storage system, about the frequency. Uh, and if what the communication tech related. Yeah, the, the communication, uh, even now there is communication, right? But in a, in a renewables heavy system, it will be very, very dynamic. So in such a system, the, the classical methods based on, you know, uh, the, the, the classical or what you call traditional assumptions, advanced calculations will not work very well because very dynamic things are changing quite uh, quite fast when it comes to frequency it's 50 hertz that's the operating frequency so you know the uh, the uh, synchronization everything is working in in synchrony in sync synchronized communication technologies mostly fiber optics Fiber optics networks and 4G and 5G, you will see uh, communication networks. There's such things have already been um, you know, implemented in many countries. The question regarding EV, electric vehicles. Yes, if you look at um, the Tesla, I'm not promoting, promoting a particular brand, but if you look at Tesla electric vehicle, 100 kilowatt hours, 100 kilowatt hours, Right. If you look at then 100, then 10 vehicles, 100 vehicles, 200, a lot of energy. You can imagine lots of energy, right? The thing is, um, if you look at the time of use tariff, the energy cost after 10.30 p.m. until 5.30 in the morning is very low, something like 13 rupees. So you charge your batteries at the rate of 13 rupees per kilowatt hour, at night or early in the morning. And then it will be dynamic energy, you know, the what you call real time dynamic energy market. And if you, if you are a lecturer, for example, at KDU, okay, you need to know, okay, your energy requirement. You can tell, you can program your computer, your, 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 your car, okay, keep, keep this much energy for me to go home. I have no other planned, planned trips today. Keep this much energy, sell this much energy to the grid, right? In your parking lot, there'll be a connection. You will plug in and then the, your vehicle will be doing, while you are working in the university, your vehicle will be doing energy business. And you can tell, you can program something like, sell this much energy, if, if the price comes to this level, price may also be dynamic. So uh, it's a smart car that will, you know, do the, do the energy business for you when you are busy lecturing. And uh, you're talking about the, the car. Actually, when it comes to that situation, what matters is the battery. Batteries, if you look at the battery cycle life, these batteries have a limited cycle life. If you charge, discharge too many times, the battery lifetime reduces. But 
currently the electric vehicle manufacturers are boasting 10000 10000 cycle life 10000 cycle life means your um, your lithium ion batteries can charge can be charged and discharged 10000 cycles before the end of its, its battery life so you that is the only thing you have to worry about i mean if the battery life cycle is is high um, uh, there's nothing nothing else to worry about really okay so thank you uh, professor cecil uh, now we have the questions uh, from professor Pereira. Uh, the first question is from dr uh, ramya kumanayake uh, the construction projects are especially affected by the current pandemic situation uh, what measure can you recommend in effectively handling construction site uh, practices under current situation? And, uh, and, and there's one, one more uh, question from my side. Uh, so you have uh, given a lot of proposal that uh, come integrating ERP, etc. But how your proposal will be effective at the real construction site? Yes, thank you very much uh, for those two questions. Uh, my focus was uh, emphasizing the fact that we don't have option. We have to go for these uh, enterprise systems. Uh, so in the current situation, uh, the practical challenges are there because the suppliers, construction workers, and other staff may not be coming to construction sites. Uh, but on the other hand, when they are available even, uh, and sometimes whatever they can do from uh, home even, uh, sometimes it's not efficient without enterprise systems. Uh, so I think uh, 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 what I'm, uh, my point is uh, looking at the organizations that were, they use this enterprise system, uh, my assessment is they were able to do better than the others. And uh, so they were, you know, they were able to manage uh, and they were ready even uh, when there's opportunity to do construction. Uh, they were much more ready and uh, they, were, they were able to manage better. Uh, so as well as this is an opportunity uh, to get this system running and as well as uh, make it more efficient even for uh, the period beyond COVID. Uh, so when they come out, uh, they can increase their efficiency, be more ready for uh, fourth industrial revolution. Uh, uh, so that is the, the point that I want to uh, make yeah uh, yeah there are limitations as you said for example uh, uh, in these applications uh, of course there are limitations okay, okay thank you professor uh, Pereira. now uh, we have just uh, uh, two more questions uh, from uh, professor gopura what are the fine moment writing drawing devices that are being developed regarding the prosthetic devices and other is uh, this, uh, uh, are you using any PID control or any tuning uh, uh, technique uh, in your work? And, uh, and there is one more question I'm very much uh, uh, wondered that when you talk about all these things, that how you actually extract the uh, power signal from the human body to uh, drive these devices? Right, so thank you for all three questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what are the, the fine movement uh, devices that are being developed regarding uh, prosthetic devices? Actually, uh, robotic uh, devices, like uh, robotic hands, which are not prosthetic devices, can uh, carry out uh, different fine movement, like drawing and writing. But the issue with the uh, prosthetic hand, especially controlling, so in order to control the prosthetic hand, usually uh, in, accordance, in accordance with the human motion intention, we use uh, uh, muscle signals or brain signals. From the muscle signals or brain signals, it is very difficult to understand the fine movement. So therefore, in the, the state of that device, uh, also uh, very little fine movement can be generated. Like because it's because of the identifying the, uh, the movement as well as the dexterity, dexterity of the hand. What I mean dexterity is, uh, as I explained in the, the uh, presentation, uh, the generation of skillful motion. So the writing 
uh, especially writing and drawing are uh, skillful notions that are very difficult to carry out. But in uh, some devices, uh, uh, motions like uh, drawing, uh, like the big kind of circles, text are available even in the uh, prosthetic devices. But still we have to develop especially prosthetic devices to carry out the fine uh, movement. But in uh, the general robotic hands, it's uh, fine movements are there. Uh, that is my answer for the first one. The second one is uh, about the, uh, uh, the PID control technique that we are using. Now, uh, different kind of uh, techniques are available to uh, tune the uh, PID gains we call the proportional integral and derivative gains, KP, KI, and KD. And uh, different kind of methods are also available. Uh, we can use Segler and Nicholas method, but usually in our case, since we are working with the uh, muscle signals, we have to use trial and error methods because uh, EMG signals, especially muscle signals, are different from person to person, as well as in the same person, uh, based on the physical, physiological uh, conditions and physical conditions, EMG signals can be changed. So therefore, uh, the, for the different person, we have to uh, use trial and error method to, con to decide the PID gains uh, uh, and also to control the system using uh, PID. And uh, Professor Arya's question uh, is about uh, uh, how do we drive this power uh, from the human body to uh, uh, to fed to these devices? Right. Now, uh, so these devices are wearable devices. So the, these devices uh, can be worn. We have human uh, robot interfaces to attach the system to the uh, human hand or human uh, leg. So the device consists of uh, motors uh, and actuators, especially we use uh, uh, DC motors. Some de devices they have used uh, pneumatic as well as the uh, hydraulic, especially for the lower limb applications. So these devices are controlled based on the EMG signal okay. or bi biological signal. So we extract the signal and then we process the signal and based on the, the EMG signal, we have to decide the required torque for the, uh, the different joints. So the modeling, actually there is a modeling in, uh, in, in that case. So okay. if the EMG signal is this much, what is the torque you have uh, to apply for the motor? That you have to decide. So the, in the, these kind of device, devices, the controlling method especially become uh, uh, kind of a useful if you if you decide the talks correctly. The talk is based on especially the biological signal. So based on biological signal, then we can control the device. And also uh, now there is a delay. Now if you take uh, your uh, muscle signal, especially muscle electrical signal. So your muscle electrical signal should be converted to mechanical work. So there is a, a delay. It's like uh, 200 millise millisecond. If, if, we, if we process the EMG signal or the biological signals, and if we can give the motor input, motor control input between that delay, so we can control the system without feeling a delay to the human being. So that's how we uh, control. Uh, the system with uh, human motion intention. Thank you. thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so now uh, we are just uh, coming to the uh, conclusion of this preliminary session of uh, uh, um, International Research uh, uh, Conference um, from Faculty of Engineering of uh, General Sir John Kotelwa Defense University. Uh, so today we started with the, uh, our session by uh, Professor uh, M. Siva Kumar from the University of Wollongo, Australia. And uh, he exceptionally highlighted the prominence that need to be provided to the reservoir water management of the world. His study showed the promising solution for the highly rising water management problem 
in global usage as well as uh, Sri Lanka as a nation with a wide industrial practices of agriculture. Then uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Cecil Kumarovadu from uh, this uh, uh, discussed about uh, the uh, this uh, socio-economic empowerment through research and innovation, uh, where uh, which could be widened and understand to of everyone on the importance of timely research and development in the institutional culture and its impacts toward the socio-economic. This was supported by captive examples from aspect of the renewable energy market and the multidisciplinary research. And uh, uh, he very emphatically uh, told that uh, how the multidisciplinary research is going to be useful if we want to really uplift the socio-economic uh, uh, structure of the society. And then uh, Professor Pereira from University of Morotova uh, discussed uh, about the enterprise application on, of the construction industry in neural normals where he conveyed the timely message for epidemic management for construction industry with the use of enterprise resource planning with the requirement of limited human resource utilization in the field of uh, uh, construction. Uh, Professor uh, Pereira was able to pragmatically address the situation with favorable solutions for construction industry and how to walk towards the fourth technological revolution. And finally, uh, Professor Ruan Gopura from University of Morotua again uh, discussed uh, about the robotic prosthetic limbs, uh, particularly uh, as a uh, new hope in the medical in the technology. Uh, he was able to provide the audience with the plethora of the new knowledge on the innovative development of advanced prosthetic limbs. And, uh, and he has, uh, and with the help of the uh, videos and the number of uh, examples, uh, he could show the effectiveness of uh, this uh, development and the importance of his study towards the present day situation where everyone has a role to play was brought out in the intriguing manner. So to conclude uh, with the number of questions that was placed by the audience, it showed the impact that the speakers were able to convey the importance of these studies to the audience. Uh, Unfortunately, due to the uh, time limitation, we could not have the, uh, this uh, uh, interaction uh, or the uh, clarification on the answers. So maybe that uh, audience will uh, write to the respective professors if they have further queries in their mind or they want to have any association as far as the research is concerned with these professors. So I think all of them will be very happy uh, to uh, help the uh, current researchers. Uh, in the end, uh, um, I, will, uh, I would like to thank uh, the organizers of this um, KDU IRC 2021, and particularly uh, Dean of Engineering uh, for giving me this opportunity to chair this plenary section. And, uh, uh, and in fact, uh, this session was, um, uh, a very useful session for me. Also, I learned a lot from the learned speakers and uh, which have uh, put forth their views on the different uh, topics which are related to the real life. And I'm also thankful to uh, uh, Dr. Isani, Mr. Dakshina and uh, Ms. Hansika for uh, providing me uh, the uh, support in successful conduction of this session. And uh, a world uh, uh, definitely a word of appreciation is due to the uh, audience who are attending this session uh, in um, <coughs> physically or connected through the virtual medium uh, without whom any session could not be themed as a successful session. And I'm happy that many audience were connected during the entire session and they continue to be connected during the entire session. So this shows that how useful and how important this, uh, this session had for the audience. So I'm thankful to the audience. And at the end, I'm thankful everyone who directly or indirectly was associated with the success of this session. Thank you very much. So I think, uh, Mr. Daksina, can we just wind up the session? 
Yes, Professor. Uh... Okay. okay. So once again, uh, thank you, everyone. Now we wind up the session with a very positive note that the audience will be taking up the positive things for their further research. Thank you. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you very much.